Hello, everyone, and welcome to PowerShell Unplugged. Whether you are brand new to PowerShell or a longtime user, this session will get you up to speed on putting the latest features of PowerShell into action. We have the PowerShell team with us here today to solve all the challenges that you face today in the operational space. With me today, I have Thomas Maurer. Welcome, Thomas. Hey, April. Great to be here today. Great to have you. I heard a rumor that you had a little technical problem today. Yeah, it was uh, something I would rather not talk about, but I as probably just committed something to a main branch, which I shouldn't have done. Um, and so luckily, I think it was not a big deal because it could fix it. Uh, but imagine if it would have been some sort of a PowerShell script and I would have some like testing secrets in that script. Um, so I'm hopefully learning more today how I could deal with that. And we've all done it and we never want to admit it, do we? <laughs> Absolutely. Never. Absolutely. But you know what? We shouldn't use secrets in our scripts, but I think we have some people here that are going to help us with that. And also how to do things like connecting to remote machines and using some really cool command line tools. So let's go ahead and bring in our guests. Yeah, absolutely. So we have some absolute superheroes and very famous people here uh, today. We're really lucky to have like Steven, Jason, Danny, Damien, and Michael uh, on this, on this video today. Hello. Hey everyone. Hi. Thank you for having time us. To introduce yourselves because I don't think everyone out there knows who all these amazing people are. Oh, sure. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, I can go first. So my name is Michael Green. I'm a product manager on the, uh, we actually have a, a product management team now that spans all things related to PowerShell, Cloud Shell, PowerShell usage in Azure, SSH, you name it. And uh, it's, it's a really fun team to be on. So thank you for giving us your time today. Thanks for being here, Michael. Uh, next up, we have Damien. Hey, hi, everyone. I'm Damien. I'm in the PowerShell team, and I specifically look at the Azure command line tools in that world. So we're looking at the Azure PowerShell modules, for example, and they help you manage all resources in Azure from PowerShell natively in PowerShell. Awesome. Now, Danny, I've worked with you in the past. Go ahead and introduce yes, yourself, to everyone. I'm Danny. I am the product manager for Azure Cloud Shell and really anything that's SSH related, whether that be in Azure, whether that's in Windows, if it's SSH, I'm your guy. Awesome. Thank you. And then we have Jason Helmick, who always gets me into trouble. Welcome, Jason. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Um, <laughs> it's great to be here. I, too, am a product manager on the PowerShell team, and I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at predictive intelligence, desired state configuration, DSC, and one of my favorites of all, Crescendo. Awesome. Next up, we have Steven. Steven, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, like everyone else. I'm a product manager on the PowerShell team. I work a lot with some of the PowerShell tooling stuff. And uh, today I'll be helping you out with some secrets. Awesome. Ooh, well, that... we definitely need help with secrets. I just want to say that is going to be really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go ahead and move everyone else backstage except Steven. Steven, you're going to be our first victim. I mean, volunteer. <laughs> to help Thomas with his secrets. I think he won't admit it out loud because we never want to admit these things, that he may have put some secrets in his PowerShell script. Yeah, uh, I mean, no one does, right? No one does. Never, never. We've never done it. Never done it. So Steven, help us out. How do we deal with, with, with secrets in PowerShell scripts? Sure thing, sure thing. Yeah, so um, don't worry, Thomas. We've all been there. I myself have uh, been... Uh, accidentally committed something I shouldn't have, but um, don't worry. So the PowerShell team is here to help with, with secrets. We have developed something we call secret management, which is a, um, <clears throat> a convenient way for users to store and manage their secrets uh, in various kinds of vaults. We um, have tried to unify how, the way you interact with vaults uh, that have different structures for different secrets and uh, make it a very easy way for you to manage secrets in your scripts without exposing them. OK, that, that sounds like very promising. So if I was to understand, this makes you like, OK, I mean, I remember doing some PowerShell scripts. And then obviously, you wanted to like schedule them, right? So you needed to store somewhere some sort of credentials, usually, um, to, to, to leverage. So you're telling me I don't have to do that anymore. Nope. Yeah, you can just store them, you know, locally in a vault or remotely in a vault, uh, simply through secret management and the extension vaults that uh, you can add along with it. 
Okay. And um, so the, the wall is obviously encrypted so that it's protected, right, from, from access. Uh, what kind of values can I can I store in this? Is it just like username, password, or is there, what else can I, can I like what type data types can I store there? Yeah, so you, we support five different kinds of secrets. We support strings, secure strings, PowerShell credentials, PS credentials, hash tables, and bytes um, as values for your secrets. Okay. Okay, so that's that's a bunch of things I can can leverage. So it's not just like username and password. That's that's awesome. Uh, uh, and you you mentioned secret. Wall. We talked. You, you just mentioned vaults as well. Um, so like, can you explain me a little bit what vaults are? Is that like and how I can leverage them? Sure. So the you know the value of secret management comes from the vault ecosystem. Extension vaults themselves are just separate PowerShell modules that you can install with secret management. Um, that have a particular uh, security <clears throat> structure that may fit your particular needs or, or, or company's needs uh, for security. Uh, you know, it leaves the advanced key and authentication management up to the vault. The vault themselves are the ones that are storing the secret securely and in a uh, safe space. You know, vaults are owned and supported by um, people, vault owners and community users who have published and distributed these vault extensions throughout the uh, PowerShell gallery. So if I am working on not a Windows device, um, maybe I'm working on Mac or OS or a Linux device, like, can I use this? And how do I get started? Yeah, so you can uh, use this anywhere PowerShell 7 runs. So we support uh, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, um, and a variety of other uh, distributions. But uh, yeah, secret management and, and the vaults themselves are all supported across those three platforms. Awesome. Awesome. We and speaking of these three platforms, so that means already, okay, it works with PowerShell 7. Um, what else do I do? Does it also work with like other versions um, as well? Yeah, so it does currently work with Windows PowerShell 5.1. Um, however, we do encourage folks to to try out the latest PowerShell 7 um, to to manage their secrets. That's where a lot of the feature updates come in and uh, probably the best experience to uh, have secret management in and uh, a lot of the other cool stuff we'll be speaking to today. Awesome. Okay. Can you go ahead and show Thomas how he's going to start enabling this for next time? <laughs> sure thing. Um, <laughs> So first, uh, we can I can talk a little bit about installing PowerShell 7 since that's kind of the, the uh, preferred one that we, we want folks to get on. So um, if you don't have PowerShell 7, you can go to the link aka.ms slash, slash get PowerShell and it will take you to our uh, open source GitHub repo. And so that's another great thing about PowerShell 7. It is open source and it has a, um, a very vast and very supportive community uh, to help you with any sort of issues you might be facing with PowerShell. Under the releases tag here, you can see our latest release at the time of recording is 7.2.6. Um, you can download the specific packages you need for the specific environments you, you need here. Uh, otherwise, there's a variety of different other install methods. We are on the Microsoft Store. And um, for other Linux and Mac users, we have a extensive documentation on how to install it on those platforms. Awesome. And we'll put links for all this uh, of all these resources for everyone in the show notes, so you can reference all this. And uh, just in case you can't see the links, it will make it easier for you all to see that after. Yeah, and another cool thing is uh, PowerShell Seven runs side by side with uh, PowerShell uh, Windows PowerShell Five One. So you can see I have them both here in the terminal. Um, let's zoom in a little bit just so you can see. I have Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Seven side by side running in Windows Terminal. Awesome. awesome. So, Stephen, how do I now go uh, and and actually work with, with with the secret store? Yeah, of course. So, um, so secret management itself is a PowerShell module, and so PowerShell modules are, of course, packaged uh, functionalities of PowerShell that you you can download and get different uh, capabilities. Uh, they're all hosted here on the PowerShell gallery. So, if I search secret secret management. Here we go. Here is the uh, specific module that you'll need to install uh, in order to start using secrets with, with various vaults. And so I'll jump over here to uh, my VS code here. And so um, 
PowerShell Gallery is the repository where all these modules are stored. We're going to use PowerShell Get, which is the inbox module uh, for package management in the tool. This already comes uh, by default installed with PowerShell 7 and is already registered with the gallery as this default shell. So if I run this command, get ps repository, you'll see here that the PowerShell gallery is already registered um, with uh, my, my PowerShell instance. Um, so the first thing you'll need to get do is to install PowerShell, uh, install secret management. So I already have it installed myself, but you'll see a progress bar if you don't have it installed and we have it there. But um, what, what is there about secret management? Um, I'm gonna run this nifty command, get command uh, here. And you'll see if I run git command with the module secret management, it lists out all the different commandlets that come with this module. And so you'll see here, we have commandlets around getting and setting secret info, um, registering and unregistering vaults. And so these are all the commandlets you'll need to manage and work with your secrets uh, in production level code. Okay, so, that's cool. Um, so after I have that, um, the secret management module installed, What's up next? Yeah, so the, the next thing you'll need to do is actually get a vault. So um, vaults are separate PowerShell modules that actually store the, um, store the secrets themselves. And like I said, these can be local or remote, uh, remote locations for your vault. So if I run the command get secret vault, you'll see nothing comes back because I have not registered any vault at all. Um, but there is a wide variety of vaults that you can check out and look for on the PowerShell gallery. If you use the find module and tag secret management, which I'll run here, you'll see this is a uh, list of all the available vaults that we have currently on the PowerShell gallery. Oh, wow. Um, there are some pretty cool ones and like pretty well-known ones like one password, key pass, I think, and then others. So um, yeah, there's some pretty good uh, third party support, I guess. It's not just Microsoft types of vaults. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I was expecting Microsoft Vault and I'm like, okay, what product is this? But it's great to see all the third parties there. We've got HashiCorp, KeyPass, LastPass, Keychain, OnePass. Um, so are these all managed by the third party themselves, Stephen? Yeah, yeah. So these are all managed by the uh, module owners themselves. They have uh, met the certain requirements to be able to uh, be able to work with secret management. And so uh, they are all um, extension vaults. Awesome. So, yeah, so they've all been vetted effectively. So they're they're secure, they're safe, and everyone's happy. That's really cool. Yep. Um, but for the sake of this demo, I'm going to use the uh, vault that we uh, on the PowerShell team have shipped ourselves. This is a secret store here. You'll see it right here. And so um, I'm going to install secret store here using the same install module from PowerShell get. Um, I already have it installed as usual, but I will run the same git command so we can see what commandlets are from this, this uh, module itself. Um, and so working with secrets, you're not going to be typically using too many of the commandlets from the vaults themselves unless you want to change some configuration, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we'll be probably predominantly using secret management to interact with these vaults. Um, so together, uh, you'll see here um, something really cool we can do in one of the powers of PowerShell is some of the pipelining stuff. But um, I'll run this and you'll see I can actually get all the commandlets together of secret management and secret store. So I can get kind of a good view of what's available to me, um, how I can interact with secrets. Will this matter if we're using PowerShell 5 or 5.1 5 in when we're trying to access these vaults. Is there any difference to us as a PowerShell user? Do we need to be on 7 or what's what's the deal with that? You, you don't need to be on 7. That being said, uh, 7 is the latest version. It's uh, in active development. Uh, Windows, uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1 is uh, inbox, but it no longer gets feature updates. So we, we highly encourage folks to uh, upgrade to PowerShell 7. Awesome. Fully supported. It's a way forward. Um, okay, great. So we have our vault installed. Let's start actually uh, working with it. So um, if I ran the same get command, um, get command with the secret secret management, I want to figure out how do I register a secret vault 
uh, with secret management. So I, that, can, that can be the vault where I store the secrets. So taking a look at the command that's available to me, I notice I, well, simply put a register secret vault. That's probably the one we're going to want to use. So um, I'm going to use uh, the get help uh, the get help commandlet in PowerShell to actually take a look, a, a little deeper look into this commandlet. Um, another great thing about PowerShell is its help system. We have a very extensive help system that includes uh, very good synopsis, descriptions, and examples of how to use uh, uh, commandlets. So I'm going to run this command here get help register secret vault with examples to actually see how I can use this. So I'll take a look. Oh, here we go. Example one. This is almost exactly the the, the command we need right here in the in the help system. But I'm gonna run it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna change the name to meet you know a more descriptive title of of the vault we want to uh, install. So um, I will let me get my cursor in the right spot. So here I'm gonna run the command register secret vault with my name as secret store with the module name as uh, specifying the secret store. And uh, I'm also tagging it as the def default vault. And so now if I run get secret vault, you'll see now I have a, a vault registered with secret management. So we're, we're getting closer to being able to store secrets. Awesome. So um, currently we, so now we've registered the vault, we actually have to set the secret up. So um, if I run get secret info, this will show me what secrets I have currently available to me. Currently, we have none of them because we have not set any secrets yet, um, but we're going to change that right now. I'm going to run set secret simply. I'm going to run set secret with a name here, my secret, and it's going to ask me for the actual secret I want to uh, store there. So um, here I'm going to say type in my secret. Um, Vault store also requires a password when uh, first setting it up. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment here, but uh, great. So I have set my secret now as my secret. So if I do get secret info one, once more, you'll see now that I have my secret secure string and my secret store um, all registered here. So um, <clears throat> we, we initially developed secret management on the hypothesis that uh, it's difficult to manage secrets securely in heterogeneous cloud environments. Advanced uh, scripts require multiple secrets and types of secrets when orchestrating across different clouds. And so custom code is often required to manage secrets across platforms. And of course, with secrets are very high stakes uh, with security implications that come along with them. Um, so so uh, Stephen, one thing I'm now interested, like, what, like when we looked at all the different vaults there, uh, with the third parties. Those are basically all I feel like kind of like remote vaults, which are shared, which I can use on multiple machines. Now, when we, the one vault you just showed us, like the secret store shipped by Microsoft, is this now like a centralized one or is this now just basically a vault like specifically running on that or stored on that machine? Yeah, great question. So secret store is stored locally on the machine. It, um, it stores files locally for the current user and uses .NET core cryptographic APIs to encrypt the file contents. Uh, we shipped this with secret management because we wanted to ensure that folks had at least one vault uh, that they can use to store their secrets. Uh, the extension vault, like I mentioned earlier, is available cross-platform Windows, Mac, and, and Linux. Uh, and it does take advantage of common security best practices. Um, but of course, it may not meet every security requirements. That's why there is a multitude of different extension vaults that you can take a look at. Yeah, no, but this is fantastic because this I can basically now take exactly what you're showing us. I can run this on my machine today without setting something up like with another service or anything if I don't have anything, right? Like I can just start using it locally on my machine to securely save my basically my secrets. That's exactly. Fantastic. Exactly, and so currently, secret uh, secret store uses secure string as the default uh, secret type. Um, but there's, of course, like I said, the other extension vaults that use different ones that might meet your better secure your security compliance. Awesome. Very cool. I like I like the amount of options that are there. That's really nice. That's really yeah, really cool. and and so I can go a little bit more into some of the options that we have here because um, that's some of the power and some of the cool things about secret management. So. Um, we, we see my secret here, but in order to get my secret, all I have to do is write simply, simply write get secret and then type the name of the secret. 
And you'll see here it comes back as a secure string because you know that would be too easy to just type uh, get secret and get the secret there. But we can view it as plain text, um, and that will display the actual value of my secret. So I just threw in a hello ignite for my secret here. So um, so you can use these kind of these kind of commands in your automation uh, where where needed. Um, Awesome. Another so, cool thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, maybe like one thing I, I'm interested is like uh, I'm a huge fan of like using get member uh, with our command lets to like look at like certain values and they, they, they can see a little bit more what I can do with it. Uh, does that also work with, with this module? Actually, the best way to do that is through some of the metadata. So um, another cool thing that secret management adds to your secrets is uh, adding some metadata to the secrets themselves so that other folks in your organization can get a little description of what the secret is best used for, um, any other data that might be pertinent to, to knowing that. So um, I can add metadata to my secret here with this command here. And you'll see now if I do get secret info and I do a, a format list, this is what the FL stands for, um, and I pipe it there, it will show me uh, more information about my secret. So this is very helpful when sharing scripts and sharing uh, secrets across organizations with different folks. And like you were alluding to earlier, yeah, we can use um, some things with like select objects, say we don't want every type of value, we can use the piping mechanism in PowerShell uh, to uh, simply just, you know, grab the, the values that we want. Um, I, it's way. just fantastic to have a object oriented like language like PowerShell to be honest like again for automation this makes things so much easier. Yeah, exactly. That was the main key scenarios that we really wanted to cover with secret management, um, sharing files across orgs, uh, <clears throat> you know, running development scripts in local test or production environments while changing only a single parameter of, of the vault that you may be using. And then, uh, you know, handling all the authentication and security needs with the with the vaults themselves. Ultimately, we just wanted to create a very convenient feature that allows users to simplify their interactions with various vaults by only needing to use a single set of commands. Fantastic. Now, again, and like one thing that comes up now, like we talked a little bit about the different vaults, and and you brought up some of the scenarios, and we saw the the. Um, the different types of like vaults you had, you showed, and some of them again are centralized somewhere, which can be used for multiple machines. Then the, the one you just showed on the local machines. So maybe you can also like, like, what happens if I don't have connectivity or what do I use when I'm in a disconnected environment versus when I'm in a connected environment? How does they work? Uh, what, what is like, how does that work? Yeah, if I don't have internet, because not that I have the world's least response, like, responsible ISP, but what if I lose internet? I need to store my secrets and retrieve them. Well, so if it's a, a local vault extension, that should work just fine, as long as you have the correct modules and vaults installed before you lose internet. Um, that will work just fine. That will you only be affected with if you are using remote vaults, uh, should your internet uh, not work. OK. Well, that's fantastic. And speaking of remote vaults, like one thing, obviously, as an Azure person, um, which popped up in my view when you showed the different walls, uh, there was something with like Azure Key Vault. So does that mean we have we can use Azure Key Vault as a vault for secret management? Yep, yep, exactly. So Azure Key Vault is a option for you for the uh, extension vault. It is a remote uh, vault uh, secret storage uh, launched by uh, Azure in the az.keyvault PowerShell module. Um, so I can I can jump into a little demo if you'd like to see how that works. Oh, yeah, I that'd be awesome. Not that Thomas and I love Azure, but we do. <laughs> um, cool. So let me. So like I said, you'll need to actually have uh, the module az.keyvault installed. You can do this by installing uh, the whole suite of Azure modules with install module az. It's going to take a little bit minute here if you haven't installed it first, but I have it already installed here. So we'll just run a, a git command with the az key vault module just so you can see that I have it installed and that I have that these are the command that's available to you. And these are a lot. Um, I know it can get a little uh, scary with, with all these commandlets, but it's, it's very, very simple. Um, all you have to do is to connect your az account uh, with Azure PowerShell and then create a new key vault. I've already gone ahead and created it. And, um, but this here is the command that you would use, uh, but you would just fill in your vault name, you know, resource group name and, and uh, necessary uh, uh, locations and stuff like that. So um, I've already gone ahead and created a, 
um, Ikey Vault here. So um, I'll just run, I'll set a name here of Ignite 2022 secret demo. And so here I already have, um, this is the command that you'll need to do, use to register the, C the AZ Key Vault with secret management. Um, and so simply just walking through it, I'm calling it my AZ Key Vault using the az.keyvault module versus the secret store module. And then I can also add things like vault parameters. So this um, uh, is needed so I can um, name the vault itself as well as add the subscription ID associated with that key vault. So um, I have already gone ahead and defined my subscription ID, but I will run this command here and boom, it's, it's registered. So <laughs> if I run, gets uh, secret vault here, you see now I have two vaults registered with secret management. I have the original one that is set as default with secret store. And now I have the newest one I created my AZ key vault one uh, registered as well. Um, awesome. So you can have multiple vaults. And I think the biggest trip up here for anyone using this is to making sure that they're saving to the default vault, but it's great that you get a multiple vaults because that's pretty common for what we do. Yeah, exactly. And so secret management is your one-stop shop to work with um, different kind of vaults all at the same time. And so uh, let's create a secret in this new remote vault. And so it's as simple as it was before. Just um, the only difference that we uh, have to do is we have to specify the vault. Since we have multiple vaults, we'll need to specify it with the vault parameter. And so I have uh, set the secret and now I just have to uh, set my secret. Okay, there we go. Um, oh, oh, that is because I have already registered this name when I was testing earlier. So let's actually change up the name of the vault uh, to, you know, Azure uh, new AZ2 uh, here. And so there we go. Yeah, you cannot there have two secrets with the with the same like name. That that makes sense. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So know. I <laughs> I was doing a little testing earlier, so I must have uh, forgot to unregister this this new yeah. new AZ secret. So, but that's good to know that yeah, you can't have a conflicting secret name, so it won't get confusing for anyone. Uh, yeah, and you wouldn't overwrite it because I think we've all done that. Yeah, I think exactly. Tom did that today, didn't he? He overwrote something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's 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 a good safety net. That's really good that it picks it up yeah. on that. So now if I run get secret info, I have my two secrets that I have currently registered with the uh, um, two vaults I have. So I have the my secret in my secret store, and then I have my new AZ2 in my uh, Azure Key Vault uh, secret store. Okay, this is this is absolutely awesome. So I love, like, obviously we have the local secret store, which we, again, can use without any Azure or any third party involved. Yep. But then the Azure one is now super interesting. So there's, like, I see, like, two super good scenarios for this. Like... First of all, um, when I'm an Azure administrator or an Azure developer and I'm working with secrets, I'm already used to like use the Azure Key Vault and this makes automation of servers and, and other systems way easier. So I can still use the, like the, the centralized um, secret store. But then also if I'm not using Azure today and I'm just working locally, for example, or I work with servers running anywhere, basically also at other cloud providers, I could use that Azure Key Vault as a centralized store for all my secrets uh, for in a secure way, and then use like the secret management basically to, to administrate my and automate my servers. So by the way, uh, you mentioned before that obviously this is great for automation. Um, can you show us a little bit more about, about that part? Like how can I now leverage this in like automation as well? Sure, yeah. So, um... You know, like like I mentioned before, Secret Store and Secret Management was designed for automation. You can use all the commandlets uh, I've since shown in this demo in your automated automated scripts. Um, but you can also set specific configurations around uh, the vaults themselves. So you saw I, I showed a little bit of the commandlets available to the specific vaults. These are all up to the vault and what they want to allow um, you to configure. But I'm gonna. Uh, show off a little bit about get secret store configuration. So um, you'll see here that these are the different kind of configuration um, settings I can change with the secret store vault. Um, the scope, the authenticated authentication needed to interact with the uh, secret uh, secret store, the password timeout, and the interaction of how it's uh, a prompt. And so we we can set these different configurations versus set configuration. Um, oh, you see. I need to actually specify parameters. 
So you can see here, I can use PowerShell's awesome tab completion to tab through the different uh, uh, available options for me. So using this, you can uh, automate your, your vault and your scripts to meet whatever needs you, you have. And of course, uh, if you ever need to change things back, you can just set secret store configuration back to default. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. So Steven, what else do we need to know about vaults and secrets? Or have you, I think you've literally covered it from beginning to end, super in depth. Um, I've actually <laughs> learned quite a bit about secret storing that I actually didn't know before. And I thought I knew a lot about secret stores, but uh, awesome. That was really, really good. Yeah, thank you. That's 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 basically it. It's it's very simple and easy to use. That's one of the main design principles we we worked with, and uh, why we developed secret uh, management and secret store to begin with. We wanted to create just a very simple, unified way for folks to work with whatever vaults they need to securely and easily manage their secrets. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen, so much for helping us out today and explaining secrets. And uh, we're going to remove Stephen and Thomas. I'm going to take a quick break and we're going to have a word from our sponsor. And then we're going to start our next segment. To learn more of the inside story of how PowerShell was built from the ground up, read Shell of an Idea by Don Jones. Get your copy today. Now that we're back from the word from our sponsor, Thomas and I have another issue. We work a lot with console commands. I use kubectl. I work a lot with Docker. Thomas, how about yourself? Yeah, of course. I, I obviously uh, like PowerShell, but unfortunately, there is a, a lot of um, command line tools or console commands, name it as you want, but um, which do not have a PowerShell module for, right? And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit like annoyed by that because I really like PowerShell and I like what we can do with it. Uh, so we have Jason here uh, to actually like the Jason Helmick. Uh, I learned PowerShell from him like when I was that big. Um, when you were so, <laughs> um, so it's an honor to have you here. And um, you're going to talk a, a little bit about how we can solve that as a community, right? Yeah. Hey, Thomas, you know, the, the world is a messy place, right? Um, and a lot of times we need that mess in order to make the machine move forward. It's chaos at first. Well, you know, one of the, the sacred vow to PowerShell is that PowerShell should empower you to help manage some of that mess and, and to get some clarity to all of that chaos. Crescendo is really no different. So first of all, let me just point this out. It's, it's, it's pretty obvious, but I just want to point this out. Console commands, or what I refer to as platform-specific native commands. I'll use native commands a lot. Native commands run just like they should already in PowerShell. So first of all, PowerShell is a shell first. And your native commands just work. The challenge is, is kind of like what you were saying, Thomas, not everybody, especially if you're a PowerShell user, really enjoys working with those native commands. Those native commands produce string output, which it's, it's tough to grab hold of that if you want to use that in automation and things like that. And they have a lot of, well, let's just say switches and, and, and parameters that oftentimes don't make any sense. And so what a PowerShell user may wish to do is turn those native commands into PowerShell commandlets. And essentially, what Crescendo does is that it puts a little wrapper around those native commands so that you can work with them as commandlets, verb dash noun. You can have the parameters spelled out the way that you want them. You can add in help. All of these great benefits that you would normally expect will be there for you um, around those native commands. So now you can use them and automate them in the environment that you wish. Oh, that sounds fantastic. So I actually, like you're telling me now, I can use a command line tool, which gives me usually string output. I can use that wrapper around this and then actually get objects and I can work with my in my script with that and can automate things as it would be a native PowerShell module. Yeah, you yeah, absolutely can. Uh, the, the best part to Crescendo is, again, holding on to that sacred vow is we want to make sure that the PowerShell users have a way of, you know, organizing that mess. So... If you like commandlets, you like modules, you like the way commandlets work, you like the fact that you have objects, I certainly do. Um, so you can use Crescendo then to recreate that environment for you and wrap those commands. Keep in mind, PowerShell, you know, this is one of the coolest things about this. 
keep in mind that PowerShell is cross-platform. So not only can you do this with native commands that are on Windows, but you can do it with native commands that are on Linux and Mac. So PowerShell is a great option to manage Linux and Mac with since it's cross-platform. Why not convert some of those, well, commands that, you know, aux sed grep, all that kind of stuff, and make it something more readable, something that you can use a little bit more comfortably. So yeah, it's cross-platform and you get all of the benefits that you would normally expect from a commandlet. That's awesome. And I think the biggest challenge we have, and you said it, the world's a messy place. There are tons of tools out there and we're constantly having to context switch, learn a new tool, learn a new thing. And if you need to manipulate a string, that's tough. Whereas I'm used to manipulating objects. So this sounds and, pretty cool. Exactly. As a matter of fact, let me just give you a quick demonstration um, before we dive into more about Christian. Let me give you a quick demonstration of what this really means to you. Um, let's take a look at my, I've got a Windows 11 box here and I'm going to, uh, well, here, let's just start up PowerShell. And I've got PowerShell 7 right here. And I, everybody on Windows uh, at some point has run ipconfig, right? And I'll do ipconfig slash all. And this is, you know, gives you all your network information about your machine. Now, a lot of times you might want to do some automation around this, but here's the problem is, you know, I, this is all string data that came out um, on my screen. And it's not like I can go select anything. Um, if I try to select object like IPv4 address, this is just going to fail miserably. Um, so this is not helping me. What would help me though, is if I take crescendo and I wrap this command, maybe I get something like this, get IP config. And IP config, I can have parameters on it like dash all. Whoops, something went wrong. Let me try that again. Now let's just try it. Oh, apparently I forgot to load the module. Here's the best part. I just screwed up, but it's really easy to fix. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, do I have it in here? No, but what I am gonna do is this. Let me just switch my folder location and show you how cool this could be. Um, I think I have it under GitHub, under, oh, let's get out here to, there it is. So here's the best part is, and I'm gonna show this so that everybody can see it if I can type the word clear in a little bit, but here's the best part. What you make with Crescendo is a PowerShell module. How cool is that? So I've got a module here. I'm going to import it. I've called this module, well, ipconfig. And I just showed you ipconfig, but now let's take a look at it. Let me get let me get out of this and get to a nice clean prompt here. And let's do get ipconfig. And we'll do dash all. Woo, there it goes. Now it's working just fine. Now I've got this great ipconfig information, but here's the best part. It's an object. How do I know it's an object? Well, one of the best parts about PowerShell is you can always pipe things to get member. And in this case, I've got this, this, this object of my ethernet adapter with all of the information in it that I can grab. It's an object. That means I can use all of the features and benefits of PowerShell, except for the ones where I type correctly, like the word clear. So let me give you an example real quick. Oh, IP config. And let's say I want to pipe this to, oh, that's cool. Thanks, predictive intelligence. Now, I can easily grab whatever information out of that object that I want. So this is what Crescendo does for you is that it takes those native commands and it makes them more usable for you to be able to work with. And here's the best part, April Thomas. Oh, this is what's where it really gets awesome. I'm on PowerShell seven, but watch, I'm going to go over to windows PowerShell five one and I'll type get IP config. Hey, it works just fine because whatever you create with Crescendo, and I'm probably going to say this 50 times, whatever you create with Crescendo, those modules, they will work all the way down level to Windows PowerShell 5.1. We felt that that was really important um, in, in creating Crescendo because a lot, of the, a lot of folks out there still have Windows 5.1 on a lot of their servers. And we know that you want to be able to do automation. So we wanted to make sure that Crescendo could help you out there. You don't have to upgrade to PowerShell 7 to be able to use the products or the artifacts from Crescendo, but you do need to be on PowerShell 7 to, to author it. One last thing, one last thing, as I want to show you real quick is, 
Oh, looky here. This is a little Mac Linux action. Now, the native command on Mac and Linux for to, to get similar networking information is ifconfig. And wow, what a mess of string data this produces. Well, here's the best part. PowerShell's cross-platform, so is Crescendo. So what I'll do is I'll just type in, oh, what did I call that when I made it? Invoke ifconfig. I think that's what I, yep, that's what I called it. Thanks, Predictive IntelliSense. And boom, now I can grab this information. So Mac, Linux, Windows, you can have complete control over your environment the way that you want to see it fit. Kind of cool? That Hi. is pretty stinking awesome because most of our customers work in environments where some of their users are on Windows devices, Mac, and even Linux devices. Um, the other thing I really liked, and we I know this isn't PowerShell related, but it's really critical to PowerShell authoring, is IntelliSense. You showed it beautifully when you're writing stuff out because we saw how fast you're typing, um, but it's predictive. It helps you write better scripts, write better code, write better things um, because it takes what it thinks you're going to write and fills it in for you because very often I'm typing get help a lot to find what I need to say and actually IntelliSense have stopped that. So that's awesome. So we can use IntelliSense. We can use it across Macs and Windows devices, and we can do everything with Crescendo across all of those OSs. That's that's really awesome. That's really cool. You know, April, if you if you call my friend Damian Caro, he'd be happy to talk to you about predictive IntelliSense and all the cool things it does. But you're absolutely right. The purpose of a good shell should help me be successful. And, and one of the things that we've been working a lot of, on is that shell experience. And so that shell experience is helping me be successful. If you've ever watched me do a video before and type, you know how terrible of a typist I am. I'm just really bad at it. Predictive IntelliSense has made me almost look professional. You do look professional, Mr. Helmick. Congrats. <laughs> so, so Crescendo really helps us um, creating these wrappers, right? Now, um, obviously, it must be easy. That's why we show this. But what would be the other options like if I would want to do that in another way and not use Crescendo, I mean, I guess there's some pretty hard options to do it in another way. Yeah, you know, and Thomas, you know, you're you're a great example of this. So, one of the th the purposes of Crescendo is really to uh, is to help folks that aren't uh, professional developers, right? They don't know how they could rewrite the command or how they could access a REST API and write the command. They don't know how to write a wrapper themselves. So Crescendo is really for folks that, you know, they just don't know how to do that. But can you? Absolutely. If you're a developer, then you already know that you could just rewrite the entire command if you wanted to, or you could write your own wrapper around it, or if it has a REST API, directly hit that API and do it yourself. But here's the interesting thing. How much time does that take you? Um, I have a lot of friends right now that are developers that have decided to use Crescendo simply because, you know, I can get it out faster this way and I don't have to think through all of that. But you can, and that's what's the important thing. What we wanted Crescendo to do was, again, answer that sacred vow to uh, give people uh, the ability to kind of empower themselves to go out there and do this without knowing, needing to know all of that cumbersome overhead that they may not already know. Yeah. No, I, it's fantastic. And it's like, I just was at an event, uh, I think shortly, like a couple of days ago. And what happened was I had people talking how they actually created like a PowerShell module using Crescendo for some CLIs tools they're using inside their company to make their life easier. And I was like, wow, so you just did that? And yes, they said, yes, we just did that using Crescendo. So pretty cool. It is, it's really cool. Um, you know, I can show you how this works if you want. And, I'd love to see it. Okay, I, I got a cute little picture. Let me show you my little picture first. Um, and, and, and show you my, my little photo here. So first of all, I want you to notice there's two things. You can be an author and you can be a user of a Crescendo module, the actual automator. To be the author, what you need to do is you need to get, and I'll show you this. We even have documentation for it. You need the Crescendo module and you can download this from the gallery. You also need to select the native command and you need to know where that native command is located. So you need the path to the native command that you want to wrap with Crescendo. And it's as easy as this. There are basically two ways to get started. 
And I'll show you both. One is you can get started with the commandlet itself called New Crescendo Command. And what that'll do is that'll get you started on creating a JSON configuration file. And what this simple JSON configuration file is, is just properties and values. What do you want to name the commandlet? What's its verb? What's its noun? What kind of parameters do you want to have? What do you want to call those parameters? When you're all done defining this, you run export crescendo module. And what pops out of that is two things. You get an auto-generated module, a PSM1, that wraps all of the, the, the stuff that you defined in that JSON. You also get a manifest, a PSD1. With those artifacts, you're now ready to just deploy those modules out to wherever you want that automation to run. One thing to keep in mind is it's really important that wherever you deploy these modules to, that those native commands exist. Remember, Crescendo is just wrapping the existing native command. It's not rewriting all of it. So those native commands need to exist out there. That's really all there is to it. You create a configuration file, you export it, you now have a working module. Pretty slick. That's pretty awesome. Sounds really easy. Are you going to show us how we do that, Jason? Oh, all right, fine. So here we go. <laughs> Let's go over here and take a look. Now, um, one of the first things I want to show you is that we do have we do have uh, documentation on all of this, and um, we're adding more and more documentation to it. You can find that, the the documentation. Go to PowerShell Docs. And you can click this guy or click this one down here, go into the documentation. And I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but a lot of the development that we do in PowerShell is, well, we kind of, well, we dog food our own stuff. We build mods. There isn't, there isn't that much stuff that we do in the engine itself, except for important engine work. So a lot of the work that we're doing is here under utility modules. And these are modules that we work on. Uh, Steven just talked about. Um, uh, secret management and secret store. Here's where you'll find Crescendo. And out of this documentation, we've got some great getting started documentation. There's a couple of reference points that I'm going to point you to, but I want you to know that the documentation is here. And one of the first things is how to install Crescendo. So let me just show you. If you don't have the module, I already have it, but let me show you how to get it. By first the way, I want. think Jason, you're not necessarily eating your own dog food. You're drinking your own champagne. Just want to point that one out. Ooh, I like that a lot better. Um, <laughs> so as you can see, I can do a fine module on Microsoft PowerShell Crescendo. And there you go. It's there. You can just install it Woo! by typing install module. And now you have it. This is what you need on your authoring box. You need to have PowerShell 7 for the authoring box. Now, here's the interesting thing, and I would be totally remiss if I didn't bring this up. Sydney, one of the other PMs on the PowerShell team, has been feverishly working on the newest version of PowerShell Get. So maybe you're already using it. Instead of PS module, it would be PS resource. And that's the new way under that if you have the new version of PowerShell Get. Once you have the module, yay, you can do a Git command on, uh, let's see, module, and I'm going to do Microsoft PowerShell Crescendo. And there's the commandlets that we shipped with the module. And what I'd like you to take most notice of is the commandlet that I'm going to come to in a moment, which is new Crescendo command. And this will help you get, this is one of the ways to help you get started on, on building um, uh, Crescendo. So awesome. That's how you get it installed. Now we're ready to pick a command and decide what we want to wrap. Ooh. Ooh. Please take a great command. Do well, I'll pick an Azure one. How about that, Thomas? <laughs> That's <a> fantastic. <laughs> okay, so so look, um, when you're going to get started on, on wrapping a command, there's a couple of things you want to think about. Now, we've documented this, so you can take a look in the documentation. You know, make sure that you're wrapping a command that's useful. You saw me demonstrate IP config that I had wrapped. I shouldn't have wrapped that. The reason being, there's already a PowerShell commandlet called get net IP address that already does that job. In other words, somebody else already did it. So don't reinvent the wheel if you don't need to. See if something already exists. But if it doesn't and you want to wrap it, that's fine. Keep in mind, you don't have to eat the whole elephant at once. I, I, I sat down with a friend of mine who wanted to wrap CubeCTL, and I, I just got to tell you, 
that's like wrapping exchange. You're going to be there a while, but maybe there's five things you need to do. So just wrap the things you need to do. You can always go back and add more stuff later. You just add stuff to the configuration. So if the, the original command is difficult to use, you don't like the original native command, if it doesn't supply the kind of help that you want, these are all great candidates to be wrapped by Crescendo. And so let's pick a command. Now, the documentation that I so expertly brought up before that, I, oh, I didn't close it. The documentation under choosing a command line tool will take you through this kind of discussion. Um, however, the next article, decide which features you want to wrap, will also take you through the conversation. But one of the things that'll point out is that in these demos in the docs, I'm using an Azure command that I'm going to wrap. And it's actually the uh, Azure Computer Management Agent. And the reason I picked this was because y'all can download this. It's, it works on Windows or Linux. It's an easy download. It doesn't mess up your systems and it's an easy removal. So if you wanna play with Crescendo before you dive in, this is a great command to play with and we're kind of documenting it for you so you can try it out. Um, so I'm gonna use AZCM agent. And let me just show you, it helps to understand a little bit about that command. So let's take a look at it real quick. Let me clear the screen and let me do AZCM agent. I'm just gonna run it. It comes up with a help file to tell me what this command is capable of doing. I'll probably sit here and explore this to find out which features I want to wrap first. In my case, I already did kind of sit down and figure that out. So I'm going to look at a particular section. I want you to see that this command has subsections and subcommands. It's a very complicated command, a lot like NetSH. Um, I'm going to go into the config section, so AZ, CM agent, config, and I can do help here and see what commands are available. And I just got to tell you, I'm just going to pick on list and get. The end result for today is I want to be able to get a particular property like the proxy URL and, and uh, be able to uh, see what that value is. And if I want, I could wrap set and change that value. In this case, uh, let's just do a list so we can see what kind of values are out there. I'm running the actual native command and notice how expertly PowerShell is running this native command, just like it's supposed to. And so maybe proxy URL or something like that is a value that I wanna get and be able to set. So now I've picked the command and I happen to know its location. So you're pretty much all set. You're all ready. Let me show you. This is cool. So. Oh. I said one way you could do this, and I'm checking where I'm at. I'm in my demo folder, okay. One way you could do this is by using new crescendo command. Um, and I know you already see the conclusion here from my predictive IntelliSense, but I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna type this out uh, manually. You specify the verb, well, I'm just gonna accept it because that is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> The verb gimme, which yes, that's not a valid verb. I'm kind of doing that intentionally right now, just so you can see that I'm, I'm just having a little fun. The noun stuff. So give me some stuff and whatever that, that actual path and location is. Now, when you run this, this gives you some information back, but let me show you what, what you're actually getting here. I'm going to pipe this to get member. Get member is the greatest discovery tool ever for objects flying down the pipeline. What kind of object do I have? Well, I have a course a crescendo command object. And here's what I want you to kind of notice. I can fill out with this command object, I could go in and I could add every possible property in here so that I don't have to manually write JSON myself if I want to. In fact, in our documentation, we give you an example of doing just that. This is one way you could do this. And, and I'll just show you. Um, this is what the documentation is basically going to show you. You've got a um, uh, new crescendo command. You can convert to JSON and save that into a file. It pre-builds the JSON for you. Like I said, that's one way. Another way you can do this is if you have an existing configuration, you can just copy and modify that one. Or along with the crescendo module, underneath the samples folder, we gave you a whole bunch of samples. You can just grab one of those. Now, what I've done is, um, Thomas, what I, what, I, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to kind of show you an example of this and get it to export and see if we could get it to work. So I've kind of pre-created one 
um, that I did. I did it this morning, a couple of minutes. Let's bring it up in VS Code. And uh, oh, there it is, uh, AZ. Thank you, Predictive Intelligence. And I just want to take a brief little kind of walkthrough of the couple of commands that I've, I've outlined here. So you can see what the JSON looks like. And you can see it's pretty straightforward. You could create this yourself. Now, in the documentation, we tell you how to create the JSON to automatically get this. This is one of the most important things at the top of the file. This is the schema. The schema will help you with tool tips as you're writing this so that you don't have to like, well, I don't remember. Now, we do have all these options in the documentation, but you don't always have the documentation up in front of you. So the schema will help you out. Underneath a command section is where you define your command. And let's just take a look at one of these. I've set up a verb, noun, and some additional information that you can specify, like what platform does this command run on? You can specify uh, Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, now, before I get to original command elements, take a look at the original name. This is the physical location, the path to that executable file. And this is where I'm going to that actual native command, azcm agent. Now, when this runs, if you remember when I was typing, this is a this this command that I want to work has a subcommand called config. Um, so in this case, what I'm doing in the original command elements is I'm saying yes, call azcm agent, but also go into the config section. And in this case, I'm saying list. So what is this command going to do? This command is going to get me a list of those configuration options. Right now, there are no additional parameters for this command. It's just going to get me whatever's out there. There's nothing optional for me to specify with a parameter. But I do want you to notice this. This is the most important part in working with native commands and crescendo. The native command that I'm working with, azcm agent, has the ability to produce JSON output. That's a structured output. So I'm asking that command here, whatever you give me, Give me that structured output. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to handle that. Down here, I have an output handler that is going to take those arguments, that output, convert it from JSON, add a member type so that I get an object type added to it. And now I have an object. In other words, this is how we make objects out of all that string data. Now, what I want to caution everyone about is Modern commands that have the ability to produce JSON are very easy to work with in Crescendo. The output is easy. As a matter of fact, the code I have on my screen is boilerplate. I just reuse it over and over and over again. When is this not going to be easy? Well, anytime you have a native command that doesn't produce a structured output, which would be things like that IP config command, I had to manually write the outputter for that. And if you've ever done that, that's not necessarily an easy task. There's a whole lot of things with regular expressions in there uh, that make that difficult. I understand that that's difficult. That problem is going to be difficult for everyone for a while. That's not a PowerShell problem. That's a life problem. Um, arbitrary text is hard to figure out. So a human must do it. Um, so if you can work with modern commands, that's going to be a lot more helpful. One other command I want to just show you that I outlined, because this one has parameters. I did a get az config property command so I could get a specific property. It has to be underneath that config section and any output I want is JSON. And in this case, I added some parameters. And again, we give you the documentation to help you with this. I know it's a little confusing at first when you see it, but what do you want the parameter to be called? What was its original name on the original command, which it was called get? What do you want to call it now? I'm following the PowerShell standard of calling properties property. So I'm going to call it a property. It's a string type. It's part of the default parameter set mandatory true on this. And I'm adding in some help information. And again, that boilerplate outputter. This is it. I'm going to take this right now. And watch, here's the magic. Watch. Here's the magic. Export. Christian. Oh, uh, let me just show you. So you see, I'm not cheating. I had, there's the configuration file, but there's nothing else here. Let's do export crescendo module. Yep. So configuration file, you can have one or many configuration files. Now, in this configuration file, I defined multiple commands, but maybe you want to define one command per configuration file. 
Yippee, you can do that too. And you can list multiple configuration files here separated by a comma. Also, what module do you want me to output and where? So I want you to call this AZCM agent PSM1. So, whoops. Uh, oh, I spelled it wrong. How about that? Oh, let's should let's, have used predictive, predictive text. I remember a smart man named Jason Helmick, the Jason Helmick, said a few moments ago, "Don't reinvent the wheel when you don't have to." Just saying. I I, I did I did listen, Jason. Just <laughs> yeah, the one in front of the like the path the, yeah, the Jason I just, file. I just noticed that I had in a one here. I'm not even sure why I had this one in, um, but oh hey. Um, that also gives me an opportunity. Um, is, let me see if this works really quick. Um, sometimes I have a bad day with, oh, it's having a bad day, but let me just see if I can run this. Oh, it already exists. I don't know how, but let's do a force. Let's do an LS. Oh, there it is. So here's how magical this is. You just saw me make it from that configuration file. I'm going to import it. AZ, come on. Ah, this is why I'm not allowed to type in public. Okay. That's not why I'm not either. There we go. So now I've got it imported. Now, if you're a PowerShell expert, you already know. Hey, I want to know what commands this module has. So you do git command module az. Oh, there it is. I got two commands. Woo um, so I'm going to do a get. Let's see if it works. Az cm agent. Agent config. Oh yeah, I, I, I got yeah yeah. We well, there's a whole bunch of information there, but it's not really the way I want to say it. But it's an object. Look 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 look. It's an object, and this is the object type that I defined for it in my outputter. So it's an object. I can work with this since it's an object. Let's do this. I'm going to um, bring up the pipe, and I'm going to use another feature of predictive IntelliSense. I'm going to call up list view so that I don't have to remember things. I want to select expand properties on local settings. Woo! That's exactly what I was looking for. But the key here is I could do this manipulation because it's an object. And so the same thing. So let's say proxy URL or, or whatever. Uh, I guess proxy URL doesn't have anything, but I've got another command out here called get az. Uh, turn off list view, AZ, CM agent, config, uh, config uh, that's what I wanted, uh, property. Oh, there we go. And property, proxy URL. Woo! So it works. Nice. nice. That's all there is to it. I mean, literally, this morning I wrapped, I just wrote a couple of quick configuration files um, for this um, Azure command. I was lucky. The output was already, it could provide some structured output, so I didn't have to really get into writing an outputter. And now I've wrapped these commands, make them very PowerShell-like, and now I can use them in my automation. This is just awesome. Uh, and it's like insane how, how um, uh, easy it, it seems to be, right? It's just a couple of lines of JSON, um, and already you have your commandlets basically ready um, for, for your... Uh, command line tool, which you usually used directly, right? So that that's awesome. By the way, I also have to say thank you to you to use the AC Connected Machine Agent um, the command line tool, which is used for Azure Arc. So uh, excited about that one too. Um, so one thing I really want to highlight, I think that is one thing I learned very clearly from you right now is check if the tool supports some sort of structured output. I think like that will make the life way easier um, than dealing with regular expressions. I think that is one that uh, I, I definitely will do <laughs> if I use Cassandra. Yeah. As a matter of fact, let me take a quick second and let me show you two things real quick. Um, it, first of all, if you, if you don't know where the PowerShell team is located, search for the PowerShell team blog. Well, technically right here, but yes. Well, yeah, yeah, I guess we are. Um, and you go out to the PowerShell team blog, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to type in up here under the search. I'm going to type crescendo. And I just want to show you something on that note, Thomas, because I, I just want folks to see this. Um, I'm going to go down. I think it was the very first announcement, preview one, um, that I had uh, uh, put up for crescendo. And I want to show you that down here, I showed the code that I used for IP config. And I know it's really small on my screen, but the output handler got a lot bigger. And I want to point something out. 
I wrote this output handler and yeah, this is not necessarily the fun part. So if you have older legacy commands that you're wrapping, it's going to take a little bit more work. We're working on some ideas here, but this is a this is just the way that it is. Modern commands that have structured output make it a lot, lot easier. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that I wrote this and I couldn't get it to work. And I had to call the uh, lead engineer for Crescendo is Jim Truer, who's one of the original PowerShell team members with Jeffrey and Bruce Payette. And he and I worked on Crescendo and this, I couldn't get this to work. And I had to call Jim and say, Jim, can you see what's wrong with this? And he goes, yep, I can see. And he fixed it. And here's what my point is. I am not going to rest. If it takes an actual developer on the PowerShell team to help me get my output to work, I'm not going to rest until we can find a way to help people with legacy commands and improving their output. Um, so yes, if you have a modern one, that's better. And one last thing I just want to show you real quick is if you would consider this, if you are um, making some crescendo commands, I realize some people are doing this for internal uses and they can't really make them public, but if you can make something public, go out to the PowerShell gallery. And if you can go out there and, Share your Crescendo module. Let me just show you a tag here you can type in. You can type in the word Crescendo built, all one word. That's a tag that will show you all of the modules built by Crescendo that people have started to put up. And so there's somebody hit me up the other day. Hey, you guys ought to wrap sys internals. You're right. Somebody from the community did. Matter of fact, famous person, Adam Driscoll, you know, one of the big contributors. Um, another way I just, you know, cause I figure people are going to yell at me. You could do find module tag um, crescendo built and I'll do the same thing. So wow. there you go. Well, that, that's, that's super cool. Like I see already like a couple of them, like Robocopy as well. Um, so this, this is, this is absolutely fantastic. So the community can actually go out and use crescendo create modules like wrappers around these tools and then share them in the PS galleries for everyone to, to make them available, which is like absolutely crazy. Which is yeah. the heart of open source, which is totally different from the way things were, you know, 10 years ago, right? Um, the tools yeah. open source, the teams open source. Um, and I know Jason, I've spoke about this to the community before, but even on the GitHub repo, people can open up issues as well contact you all with questions, especially if you don't see something, but definitely give the feedback to everyone out there about Crescendo and the other PowerShell products. The more yeah. you talk about it, the more these folks are listening. Absolutely. Thanks, April. And, and you know what? Um, I, I would encourage folks, please, as you just mentioned, April, come out to the GitHub, which is uh, just, you could search, uh, use your favorite search engine. You could search for GitHub Crescendo, and it'll take you right out to our GitHub. And please, if you have issues, file an issue. Jim and I are out there. We're getting um, uh, close, uh, say a couple of months from a, a, a new release uh, and some fixes and some things like that, some new features that people have requested. So come on out to our GitHub. Tell us what's going on. And we'll put a link for everyone in the show notes and we'll flash a banner down so you can have the link so you can get there quickly. Um, awesome. Jason, is there anything else that we missed about Crescendo today? Because that was a lot. That was awesome. Because um, I won't admit how I've had to manipulate strings before to get them as objects. And We handle objects. We handle commands that need elevation for both Windows and Mac. Crescendo will do it all. Come check out our docs and we'll be adding more later. Awesome. Thank you, Jason, so much. Cheers. Lovely to have you. Awesome. Well, you. we're going to take a break from Jason. We're going to come back in a couple of moments and we're going to tackle our next subject, so stay tuned. Learn more about the inside stories of the development and building of PowerShell. Get your copy of Shell of an Idea by Don Jones today. Welcome back and thanks to our sponsor for that amazing message. So Thomas, tell me what's next? Next, we're gonna talk about PowerShell remoting or remoting in general, because that's a very exciting topic. Um, and. This makes it obviously easy to manage devices remotely and so on. And we know that IT pros as well as developers do that all the time. So we have Danny here uh, to talk more about this. And Danny, can you tell us a little bit about like all the awesome things uh, the PowerShell is doing, the PowerShell team is doing when it comes to remoting? Yeah, and I'd say kind of a, it's an all up state of remoting today. There's there's some, I'd say, more well-known technologies in the Windows space, whether that be WinRM, RDP, WAC is starting to come in as more of a remote management tool as well. 
Uh, and then there's also kind of SSH on the Linux side, Unix side, Mac side, right? And from kind of an all of management and remoting space, we're looking at how do we want the remote rooting space to evolve over the next few years? Uh, from the PowerShell side, we're primarily uh, investing in SSH. WinRM is more of a, a legacy remoting uh, functionality at this point. It's not deprecated, uh, it's not, but it is in servicing. So it's not really seeing any of the new features that, we're, that we have for SSH, whether that's two-factor auth. Uh, and really, there's a lot of benefits to SSH as well, like not having to do uh, a double hop off, right? So... so so to interrupt you quickly, like I just want to yeah, sorry. Like amplify this really, really strongly because what you just said is that we have actually SSH and mm -hmm. we can use that with PowerShell and we can use that with Windows and Linux exactly. and Mac OS. Is that like exactly. a fair thing to say? Okay. So yeah, SSH has been around for a while on the, the Unix side and it's really a, a kind of a, a well-baked tool, right? It's, it has a lot of functionality. It has a lot of depth to SSH. And really, it works, and it's probably some of the things that I'd say the Mac OS folks and the the Unix folks like to say. Oh, this is one of the things that, that we did better. And right, SSH is also on Windows. It's been on Windows. It's been in Windows client uh, as SSH client by default since 2018, and it's also available as SSH server as a feature on demand or optional feature on both Windows client and Windows server. And so. SSH is in box. It's there by default on really all modern Windows SKUs. And so that's the direction we're going for, for PowerShell and remoting in the future and really for remoting all up. I don't think okay. I realized that SSH was there by default, like mm -hmm. out of the box, I mean, like available, because I've always RDP'd into servers when, when I'm on a Windows server. But also when we're working in Azure, we know that RDP is the greatest risk of attack for a Windows machine, right? In the cloud. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And one of the great things about SSH being there on Windows, right, is uh, the, the security, right? What I like to say is you can't audit mouse clicks, right? So if you RDP into a machine, once you're in that box, you can do whatever you like. And if you just click in your mouse, no one can figure out what that what you've done unless they're recording your screen. With SSH, you can get command logs. With PowerShell remoting over SSH, you can get the PowerShell logs. So you have this baked in better security mechanism just by the remoting, just from the remoting protocol. No, I love it. And I love that it's like just built in by default. I think that is something a lot of people did not know. It's like, hey, I have SSH already on my machine, right? I don't need to spin up um, a third party tool or WSL mm -hmm. or anything. I can just like basically use the old common prompt, if, if you will, and exactly. run SSH. And you exactly. actually have the tool there available. So again, everyone like who haven't tried it out, like check it out. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to see a demo? Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's jump into the meat and potatoes. You know, let's do it. Oh, let me get rid of this nest. Oh, we're an inception. Woohoo! All right. So here, I'm just on a, a local, I say, PowerShell window. You can see I'm on. Uh, come on, tab. Oh, no. Here we go. There we go. So you see I'm on uh, a Windows machine. I have uh, PowerShell 7.2 here. I have done no additional setup on my client machine to have, I'd say, native SSH here. So you can see that SSH is here, related things like SFTP is here, right? So all of that, that's a native richness of SSH and all the related tools is already on box, right? And so what we can also do is, uh, Actually, can I, can I start that over? They we're in a we're in a weird flow from just doing local, and then we need to jump to Azure. Yeah, so let's go sense. here. Did you want to start from here? Do you want to start from your screen? I'll I'll start from the screen. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? So when yeah. I when I share the screens, but the, wow, but the, it's more of a should we do a can one of you prompt me to say like to get because it's a kind of a hard jump to go from I'd say window or open SSH is on on the box into yep. uh, Azure, or we should also I, probably do a jump into where is it available? I, I like what I could do is I could ask you, okay, when you show it, it's there and you show mm -hmm. like, hey, there is the command. And then I could just jump in and say, hey, um, so I manage a lot of like Azure VMs. Um, mm -hmm. How do I use that now to like work with an Azure VM? Can you show us how Perfect. to connect to an Azure Perfect. VM or something like that? 
Perfect. Sounds okay. good. And then actually, I'll I'll let me show it here, and then show the docs on where it's actually at. And so I actually have the the docs on how to get it started. So I'll yep. actually just minimize this screen and say, if you want to enable it, here the documentation is here, and we can throw it in the little banner. And then we'll do your prompt to Azure. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Okay. Should I just go, or are you giving me a prompt? Oh yeah, um, just go for it. I'll let me okay. um, let me do a time. Or sorry, Thomas, do you want to do it? A... Uh, I cannot remember where we were there. That's that's just about the SS, local SSH. Yeah, right? it's SSH. So you can see here we have SSH already installed, something like that. Yeah. Right. So you can see here we have SSH already on box. I've done no additional configuration to get this SSH client. But if you want to get SSH server, we actually have some really easy steps in our documentation on how to do that, right? So you can go and do it through the GUI and things like optional features, or we also have a PowerShell command to go and PowerShell commands to go and enable this functionality, whether it's your open SSH client or your open SSH server. Oh, that's that's fantastic. So I can easily use that. Obviously, now I could like um, use SSH to connect to a system or a server running in my local environment to connect and do all that um, remote management. Uh, one thing I do and a lot, of, a lot of our viewers do is like manage Azure VMs. Can you sure. maybe show us like how I would now connect from a local SSH client or from a, a local machine using yeah. SSH in Azure VM? Yeah. So let me let me pull up my PowerShell one do again. And so actually some folks might already be familiar with uh, this functionality that we have in Azure called uh, AAD login for Linux, where you can say AZ SSH VM, and then you can log into a, a VM with your, I'd say, Azure identity, right? So with AAD. We actually have this, we've expanded this functionality to both support username and password login, key based login, Windows machines as well. And so we have this, I'd say, full, I'd say, feature rich. Uh, 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 scenario and experience here. So we have both the AZ SSH VM command, but we also have this uh, PowerShell called PowerShell command called enter AZ VM. So enter AZ VM. And then what I can do is just specify the details of the machine that I want to connect to. And so here I have my resource group name. Thank you. Thank you to Predictive IntelliSense. Here we go. So we got resource group name. We have a Windows, uh, a Windows Server Machine 22. It's in my resource group when demo. This is actually an ARP machine. And so we've expanded this these commands to support uh, Azure ARP as well. And so here you can see I've defined that it is a hybrid compute for resource type. So that means it's a it's an ARP machine. You can also specify that it's just Microsoft.compute to say, oh, this is just a regular Azure machine. Uh, and then I've specified a local user. And so if I ex yeah, if ahead. I'm logging into like a really highly secure environment, Danny, mm -hmm. can I enable two-factor authentication or MFA? Yeah, for sure. So SSH natively supports uh, different type, uh, different types of two-factor auth, whether that's a UB key or something like that. Uh, there's also with AAD, you can enable uh, two-factor auth with just your Azure login, and we'll we'll honor any of those kind of two-factor auths that you have set up for your AAD account. So I can use my face. Exactly. So awesome. Windows Hello, uh, we are working on adding support for things like that. And so you can get your nice face login, you can get your biometric fingerprint. Those are all things that are planned for the future. Right now, it's the standard, I'd say, things like UB keys uh, or uh, AAD two-factor auth to get prompted on your computer. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, because I think yeah. most of the environments I'm remoting, I mean, I say most, we should all have secure environments, but I work with a lot of really secure customers, right? And mm -hmm. RDP is not an option. We talk about all the ways, like just-in-time access, et cetera. Um, so this is really, really cool. And having MFA or two-factor authentication there is uh, really takes all the boxes for the compliance as well. Exactly. And that's one of the big things about SSH is this, is, I'd say, as we move forward with SSH and we add more features like, uh, like Gia and things like that. As we're setting SSH up to be the most secure way to connect. And so you really want it to be really a no-brainer 
for folks to move over. And we, we understand that folks have legacy workloads that might be running, running on WinRM or they're just used to RDP. And what we really want is for it to be worth it for customers to move to SSH. And uh, with all the security features, uh, just even natively with SSH, it's already a no-brainer. Awesome. Yeah, so if I just jump back to the command we're at, uh, here I'm, at, I'm connecting to an ARC machine. And actually, the uh, a really cool thing about us connecting to ARC machines is a lot of times for your on-premise machines, you don't want a public IP address and you don't want really any inbound ports open. And so actually, when we're connecting to ARC machines here, we're connecting without a public IP address or without a public uh, inbound port. And so if you want to connect to really any of your machines, you can onboard them into ARC. ARC, I'll remind you, is free to onboard. And you can also set up this connectivity. And right now we're in preview and it's a free, it's a free preview. And so you can go and connect to any of these machines really in less than five minutes. If you onboard it to ARC, you set up this remoting. And as you can see here, uh, I, I, can, I can SSH to my machine. It's a Windows machine. There's no key. So I'm going to set up, uh, I'm going to enter my password. Hopefully I type it correctly. And there we go. I'm on my uh, Windows server. And so you can say, who am I? You can see I am on my Windows uh, Server 22, and I'm logged in as Danny on this machine. And so, the, yeah, go ahead. So this is super exciting. So I just to like to, to like um, uh, summarize this. Like what you just did is like from your management machine, like from your notebook or mm -hmm. from your device, you connected um, to a machine running somewhere in the world, um, probably in the in a data center or at an mm -hmm. edge location or even like in Azure. Um, and you basically didn't need to open any ports for that matter into like public in like the firewalls of the company. Um, you were just able exactly. to do that using the Azure control plane and the Azure Arch agent in this case exactly. to make that secure connection. Is that a fair summary? No, that that's perfect. You know, and really what we want it to enable is really, and one with Arc is bringing the Azure control plane really anywhere, right? And so that's, uh, if you don't have something on-prem, if you have something a different cloud provider, we want you to be able to use the Azure management plane to get to that resource, right? And especially with SSH, you can now easily get uh, a connection to any of your machines, right? And so here on this, on my local machine, I had to do, I'd say, uh, an Azure CLI install, Azure PowerShell, uh, get the appropriate extension for Azure CLI, which is the SSH extension or the appropriate Azure PowerShell module, which is az.ssh. But we can also do things like go to Cloud Shell where we have uh, we have those things installed uh, by default, right? And so if I just go into uh, my Azure Cloud Shell, open up Cloud Shell, we'll let Cloud Shell start up. And so now I'm in, I'd say, an environment where I have all of those tools already. So just to show the, the, the AZ CLI experience, if I say AZ SSH ARC, specify my resource group, it helps if I do a, a double dash here, resource group. Uh, and let's just do, uh, let's do the Linux machine, Lin demo. And so I'll actually just show you the, the machine I'm gonna connect to. It's right here, so you can follow along more closely. So here, I'm connecting to my resource group, Lindemo. I have the name of my machine, which is uh, lin-u20. And here, if I want to log in with my AAD credentials, that's all I need, is I just need to specify my resource group and the name of my machine, and I'll get authenticated with my AAD account. And so you can see here, I'm logged in as, let's just say my alias at microsoft.com. I'm now on this Linux machine, just logged in as my alias at microsoft.com. So the, the awesome thing is we talk about, hey, I want to be able to remote into any machine, but now we can do that from any machine. As long as you have a browser, you can just go into the portal, use Cloud Shell, and connect to any of the machines that you've onboarded. So we this is all being governed by Azure AD, which is awesome. So all by group exactly. membership, et cetera. So if you're you know, you, you want to admin a certain group of servers or services or applications in your stack, it literally is controlled by that backplane. You don't have to manage users anymore. And I think the biggest issue that organizations face is when they have a lever or they're managing 
the the logins for all their boxes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk about the amount of times I went into SQL boxes under a, a, a group login, if you will, um, or even a lot of the Linux boxes. We used to use an admin login that was a group admin. It wasn't an AAD thing. So this is awesome that we can govern who logs in, how they do it via group membership in Azure AD. Cool. Exactly. Exactly. And like I said before, earlier, uh, the Linux AAD is there. Windows AAD support will be coming very soon. And so, yeah, go assign your groups, create your policies. And you can really do all this delegated access really just natively with policy or really any way you want to assign identities. Cool. Danny, is the uh, Windows access on the roadmap? Yeah, so Windows access with AAD is on yeah. the roadmap. It, is, it will be coming out soon, um, yeah. but it, it is coming. Uh, but cool. on that note, you don't necessarily need just AAD in order to get this, I'd say, seamless experience. And so actually, if I just jump over to my Windows machine, here I have that same Windows server that I connected to earlier. We actually have this new uh, preview functionality here that's called just the Connect. And so we're bringing over that same Connect experience that you have for Azure IaaS machines also to Arc machines. And so as I connected to my, my Windows machine earlier, I used a username and password. Here I'll supply my username. And we now have this new like connect and browser button. So if I click this button, it's going to take over my Cloud Shell experience and say, hey, you're going to, we're going to uh, take over Cloud Shell, make sure you don't have anything you want saved. So I'm going to say continue. And it's going to take what I have for Cloud Shell. It's going to take this command that it's already built for me and automatically execute it in Cloud Shell. And so now I can just supply my password and I'm on that machine. And so if I did this setup with a key, it's one click once I have my key. If I have my password uh, just ready to go, I can easily get into my machine really from anywhere. If it's a username and password login, key-based login, AAD login, from any machine to any machine. That's awesome. Amazing. That makes that's that's pretty solid. I I can imagine like like administrators or operators using this, like sitting in the evening in the bar or in a in a pub. Forgot like need like get an alert need to restart like a service on a machine or something uh, mm -hmm. and log in from their phone with an SSH client or with Cloud Shell um, to actually quickly do that. I'm not sure if that's a good idea um, to do that, but uh, it, but it's a secure way actually. No VPN needed, nothing like that. Um, again, you can support it with multi-factor. So mm -hmm. absolutely love that solution. I think sitting in a pub is always a good idea, Thomas. So I think your idea is brilliant. So, and also the kind of the other thing that's great if you are at the pub or really not at the pub as well, <laughs> this same the same experience and the same uh, way to connect without a public IP address. We also support native SSH tooling, and so if I just jump back to I'd say my local experience, and so you can see here I'm back on my my local client machine. We have a, a command called az ssh config. And so what this does is it produces an SSH config file. And so you can see here, I have all, all of the, the remaining uh, things that autofills, like that resource group, the name, uh, local user, all of that's the same, same with that resource type. The new thing that we have to supply is the, the file. So where do you want this SSH config file to be produced to? And so if I just create this config file, I have it right to temp.config. I remember to hit enter. And it's going to say, hey, there's some sensitive information here, uh, just because you don't really want to keep a lot of this information that might be used for auth or uh, AAD certs uh, persisted. So you want to delete this once you're done. But now I have this SSH config file that I can pass to I'd say, any SS open SSH based tool. So here, if I just say SSH, I pass in, pass in a, uh, a dash F, which is specifying the, the file. And I can now specify the resource group, which is win demo, dash the name of the machine, which is win, oops, dash server 22, and then the name of the user I want to connect as. I can connect if I do my password again to that machine just from a native SSH tool. So if you want to use SFTP, if you want to use, I'd say, a third party tool like Ansible, right, where you're taking this SSH config, uh, passing it to Ansible. You can connect to those machines without a public IP address. The same thing applies for PowerShell remoting, uh, VS Code remote debugging. Anything that can take an SSH config file can 
be will be able to leverage this technology. And I could see this being hugely useful in any of the DevOps tooling when we're trying to either automate something, put into a pipeline, et cetera, for access, this would be really, really good. Exactly, exactly. And as you, you talk about like DevOps tooling, right? And we, we kind of acknowledge that we're saying, hey folks, come and adopt SSH. We think it's, a, it's more secure. There's, there's better auditing, things like that. We fully acknowledge that there might be scenarios where, yeah, you're comfortable with RDP. You still want to connect with RDP. And so we actually, here, I'll just type it out again. If I, if I say AZ SSH arc, and I specify here, let's get the, the right machine here, uh, a Linux demo, uh, that, uh, sorry, that Windows machine that I have. We also support this dash dash RDP parameter. And so what this is doing is opening up an RDP session over SSH tunneling. And so on my remote machine, there's no RDP ports open. RDP still has to be on and listening, but it doesn't have to be exposed. So I still have to do my SSH off here. So I off into my SSH tunnel, and then on a separate machine here, I'll, I'll pull it over. I'm getting prompted to do my RDP off. So you do have to do a double off here, but I can then open up. I got prompted for, yes, I want to trust this computer. And now it's going to open up a uh, port forwarding from localhost onto that remote server. And so this server does not have any public IP address, does not have any inbound ports it does not have any RDP ports open, but now I have an RDP session to my Windows machine over an SSH tunnel. Wow, this That's is just cool. so awesome. And again, like I cannot stress this enough, but this is all done like securely over the Azure control plane using Azure AD to authenticate. Um, absolutely great. No, I absolutely exactly. love it. And I think there's a huge use case here. So um, I used to work for a managed service provider in the UK. I worked for several of them. And very often we had a jump box we already peed into. Then that was, quote, secure to then get into the other areas. Again, you couldn't track when something went down or there was an outage or a security breach. And we were in that place many times where someone used the jump box to do something malicious or left another attack sure. surface, right? Um, sure. I could see a massive, massive use case for this to access those data center, you know, uh, our servers in a data center, whether I'm the MSP or I'm the con the customer it's itself. And then we have exactly. that traceability of SSH. We have two factor off. Um, we can track what goes on and when in our data centers. This is awesome. I see a really good use case for that. Yeah. And, I, and I'd say for, for connectivity with SSH for, I'd say a machine that you can't see, right. There's a few different ways you can connect. One, I'd say there's the the faked line of sight is what I like to call it, which is like really a VPN, right? And so you have a VPN, it gives you that network that uh, I'd say spans the gap and you can see that machine to be able to connect. There's the jump box solution, which mm -hmm. I'd say is a great solution. You secure the, the connectivity between the jump box uh, and the target machine and you just connect from your, from your client to the jump box, also a great solution. And then there's also a proxy-based solution where you have, I'd say, bits on both the server and on the client side. And that's what we're using here. It's just a proxy-based solution. And so, and as you can see, a lot, of, a lot of times, one of those solutions might not be a kind of fits all for everyone. And each customer is going to have to pick the solution that works best for them. Absolutely. And that's why I'd say Microsoft has multiple solutions. We have a, a, a v Microsoft VPN. If you're an Azure customer, we have Azure Bastion. And we also have this proxy-based uh, way to connect, especially for our machines, where you might need another way of connecting. Yep. Absolutely. No, this this is great stuff. Again, I'm super excited about this. Obviously, remote managing machines, um, uh, making sure that like like all these operations are super easy to do. Uh, and again, going over SSH, that's real value because as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. I showed is like, okay, well, you cannot just use it in the Azure CLI. You can actually like use the native SSH tooling. Uh, as far as I understand, you could also use S um, SCP to copy file tra and make exactly. file transfers as well. So really exciting stuff. Now, the question is like, what do you have more coming? Like, can you share a little bit of the roadmap here? Yeah, and so our roadmap is really about how do we make SSH simple and secure to use, right? And so there's there's things that go into that of like, how do I configure SSH on both my client and on my server, right? And so we're doing improvements for how do you actually install and configure SSH on client and servers, whether that be on-prem or in Azure. 
uh, really the investments in the ease of connectivity with to the Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell experiences I showed here, and really making sure that you don't have to know five different commands to connect to your five different machines. You really want it to be a kind of a one-stop shop for really all of your SSH needs, no matter what you're connecting to. And uh, kind of the last area, a large area of investment is the continuing security features, right? How do we uh, how do we make SSH the most desirable remoting technology for folks to migrate and use? That's awesome. awesome. Um, and I think we'll put the link for the roadmap for everyone to have a look at uh, in the show exactly. notes so they can reference it. Again, Microsoft has done a great job. Every product team puts the roadmap out and you guys are great at not only answering kind of the community questions under GitHub and GitHub issues, but your roadmap is fantastic. So everyone can see what's coming. And especially with a feature like this, they can see all the cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Exactly. And if, if folks are interested in our GitHub, it's in the PowerShell repo. It's the Win32 OpenSSH repo. That's where we release all of our beta releases. And then all of our, I'd say, GA quote unquote releases are what releases inbox for Windows. But we're still active on the uh, OpenSSH uh, uh, GitHub repo. So if you want to get a hold of us, just open an issue there uh, and we will see it. Awesome. Thank you, Danny. That was awesome. That's really cool to see. I think it's simplified a lot of our connectivity woes that we've had in the past and kind of gives it an uncomplicated and secure control plane. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, um, Danny. I think we're going to take a quick break and we're going to have another quick five to 10 second break for people that want to hear a word from our sponsors. Welcome back everyone. Hope you enjoyed our little break from our sponsor. So Thomas, I thought it was pretty cool how everyone automatically could write these great commands without a lot of errors because it takes me a while to write commands. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's something which I, through all these sessions, what was like I was looking at is like how the shell actually improved, like what they were doing and was predicting what they wanted to write. And like, what is that all about? Where is this magic coming from? So we have Damien here to talk more about this. Hey, Damien. Hey, hi, everyone. <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to, uh, to talk about uh, the magic you're talking from the shell point of view. We, we, we use, usually call it predictive intelligence. Uh, and, and think of it as intelligence you have in the IDEs but brought to the shell uh, to help developers, system admin, whoever interacts with the command line to be more efficient, be more productive. Reducing typos, not having to do blah blah blah, and then backspace, 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 and and or missing parameters, missing parameter values because you don't remember what is required, and you end up having that command that fails, and then you have to type it again and go to the history. So all of that problem was something that we observed by having customers in the studio, and we looked at what they were typing. We gave them some studies, um, challenges, and the, we went through and observed how they were doing. And we're like, no, we need to address that problem. And that's how we came with the idea of predictive intelligence. Um, at the end of the day, we discovered that predictive intelligence is helping our developers, customers to reduce the number of characters they're typing to achieve a certain goal, to achieve a certain command. And it was helpful for most of them. Um, if you're familiar with PowerShell, I tend to say that predictive intelligence is kind of that completion on steroids, that's kind of how I position it. And we really want to make it fully uh, intuitive. It, it has to be present, but you don't feel it's there. However, when you don't have predictive intelligence, you're starting to feel something is off or something is missing. And you know, I had installed a new machine recently and I not installed the predictive intelligence on my environment and I was like, Hold on, something is wrong. And I was typing and I didn't have that auto completion. I was like, hold on, it's, it's, it, it was missing like on, on line number two. And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to do that. So I went back and installed everything and, and now I'm back into my comfortable environment. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. No, and I think. Get... Go ahead, Thomas. No, I think I think what what is fantastic about it is it really like what I was just thinking like it brings the power into PowerShell, right? Like the one example which just struck me is like you're buying a new notebook or something, or you sit in front of a notebook, you open up the terminal, and then you have different shells there, and like usually like you need to know what you're doing, right? Now when you open PowerShell, like you get the shell experience from PowerShell with predictive intelligence, you actually get a super strong helper here 
like actually helps you. Okay, what do you actually want to achieve and how can you achieve that? So I find this super, super helpful. Absolutely. And I think also on top of that, um, when we're writing code or writing commands, we have to think about our different languages, right? Different backgrounds. So um, I live in the UK and for us, we use S's instead of Z's. So I work with a lot of developers and um, IT pros that constantly mess up commands because of letter swapping and also things like neurodiversity, right? We've all learned different ways to do things and uh, we might have different uh, neurodiversity requirements in our life. You know, and I work with a lot, I've worked with a lot of people that are dyslexic. It helps them know what comes where and to get the words in space. Um, and I think you're right, uh, Damien, you said it, like getting words out, knowing where things need to be, because I think, you know, we forget if we don't use it all the time where something needs to be in, in that command or writing big scripts. So it's really, really cool to see this to help us write better scripts. Yeah, absolutely. So Damien, can us can you tell us a little bit like about like how like the history of these predictors work and like how it works and because we saw so many like things like autocomplete and all that. Can you tell us a little bit more and explain how that actually works? <clears throat> yes. Um, so I would say the core of the of this experience relies in PS Readline. It's it's what actually handled that experience in the terminal. And we're going to dive deeper in that, but maybe I can do a quick demo and, and show you how that looks like. And as we navigate through uh, the, the demo, I will tell you how we got there, what led um, each step of the product development. Sounds great. <clears throat> so this is, this is my terminal. And um, I think what you've seen so far is this experience. So you're typing a, co a code and I don't know if you can see it, but in the yellow, you have the command, and I'm taking git here as, as one of the common commands that we're using. It's not necessarily PowerShell, but it is a command that we're using in the terminal, uh, and we are treating all those uh, equivalently. Uh, git or a PowerShell command would behave the same way in that experience. And then you have status, which is in the plain gray kind of thing. So I don't know if you can really see that. So that's what the predictive sense is it's looking in my history and suggesting what would be the completion of the command that I may want to run. Then I have the right row that will actually naturally complete the command, or I could use tab to do that. Type enter, and it says everything is good or, or nice. Now, um, coming back to what you mentioned at the beginning, Thomas, you can see the git status to know if you're committing something uh, on the main branch or not. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's change the color so everyone can read better on the, on the screen. And um, predictive intelligence allows to change the color of the predictions. So let me get the right color. And now if I do the grid status again, I, I have a blue background. So it's kind of easy if, if, you, if you're like me, not very easy, at ease with the gray, darker gray on the back background that, that helps me understand where I am in my, uh, in my prediction. Ooh, I like that. I really like that a lot because that, that's part of my issue is seeing when the colors are in that kind of gray scale. I just miss stuff all the time. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> let me clear generally here a bit. Oops, can you see? I'm bad at doing typos. I'm good at doing typos and bad at that. Um, so the, 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 the prediction or suggestion, as I said, they, they come from my history and you can have very long history here. Um, that is from the history of what I've been using and getting policies. Uh, and it completes the whole line uh, based on what's in, the, in that file. Um, the one I really like about the history is this one. <laughs> Let me type it again. <laughs> here it is. Um, now history is, is good. Um, but sometimes you want more than one line. You, you, you're not sure that what is recommended is what you're looking for, or it is not exactly what you're looking. It may be slightly different. You may want to have more options. And, and for that, you have a different experience that is exposed with the predictive intelligence. It is the list view. So far, we've been looking at the line, inline view, and now we're switching to list view. So in order to do that, um, it's simple. I just press F2, and now I can do the same command. Oh wow! Oh, I like that. You see, you have a bunch of history recommend a uh, bunch of commands from history. Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh so yeah, I absolutely love that. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like what I just like, I just want to quickly like 
like amplify this what what Damien just showed us. Like you you get this, and 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 maybe it's also like Damien, you can tell me that as well. You get this, even if I have now PowerShell open, I'm not writing PowerShell code. I'm not using the PowerShell language. Like I use Git as a command line tool and it still works, right? <clears throat> that is correct. And what I want to highlight here in the in the history, I just started to type GI. And it shows the git command, obviously, but it also shows commands that have those two characters within. And I'm going to use the a row, the down the row to select different lines. And you can see it's highlighting line number four right now. It shows kube login because I've been using kube login. Or it shows um, a PS read line option that uses a history and plugin. So it, it is actually searching through the history based on the characters you've been typing, not just the beginning of the command. So it, it, it goes beyond just the idea of this is how my command should look like. I love this. This is great. I mean, this is a lifesaver because especially if I clear screen or something or I did something and I lost my history, this is perfect. So Damien, I mean, one thing you mentioned is like history, um, but like I saw that like it's it's even more intelligent than that, right? <laughs> it, it is, it is really. Uh, when we had that first discussion, and, and, and that's an interesting development we, we had at the very beginning of, of this ideation, um, the first idea was to have the history being brought to Gookman. But as you said, we wanted to go beyond that. And we wanted to expose this experience to areas where you have a lot of commands that are available, and it's hard to navigate through all of them. And the Azure PowerShell commands are a very good candidate for that. There are about 5,000 commands now in Azure PowerShell or so. And think of the number of parameter combination that may come with it. So we had to find a way to expose and bring that into this experience. So customers who are typing the Azure PowerShell commands would have an easier way to get their way through those 5,000 commands or so. Can that's you... and, that's how, and that's how we come with the history and plugins. And I'm going to run that command. So can you show us that? Like, how would I now, like, I mean, I believe you that it's working, but like, can you show us how I would actually like navigate through this and, and use it? Yes. <clears throat> so I'm starting to type something like, I want to create a resource group in Azure. Oops. I start to type resource as resource group, and it shows me a couple of things. Um, first of all, I have the first three lines, which are my history of command. And then you have the, the remaining six of them, which, and you can see on the right hand side of the, of the, of the predictions, uh, between the square bracket, easy predictor. So we are calling an API. <clears throat> to ask what could be the command that would match this, uh, these three characters. And a Z predictor, which is driven by AI, will actually look in all the commands that are available, which is the command that is the most likely that you will want to run at that time based on your context. That's really cool. Uh, and I guess from a security standpoint, like uh, standpoint, when I'm querying this API, how do I know my data secure? Because I'm sending data over, right? And it's sending data back. So how do how do we secure that, or how do we know it's secure? So we, we're not sending any any values, any parameter values to um, uh, to the API. We are sending the parameters and the command. Um, and let me uh, let me switch very quickly uh, to. A uh, trace I've been taking uh, just a couple of minutes ago uh, that shows how that looks like. <clears throat> and, and here, it's basically um, a trace. Uh, I've been sniffing the HTTP trace that we're sending to our API. And you can see that we're sending the history, the last two commands that have been executed. So in that case, that's a get easy resource group, get easy resource group dash name. And the value has been obfuscated. We're not sending anything. We're just sending three stars. Uh, we're sending a three stars because we want to know that it is a value that has been removed and, and that's, that's it. And the response from the API is a, a list of, of commands with a description 
that are the possible or command that would be fitting the next command to execute. Um, so in that case, you have a get is a resource group, you have remove is a resource group, <laughs> and obviously you may create one and you want to delete and, and so on. And we go through the list and the list, as I said, is dynamic. The list evolved depending on what we have done before. It depends on the history that we're sending. Oh, this is awesome. So we're not sending any like personalized data. We actually, Anna and I do that. Uh, we just send like, what is the customer wants to do, but there's no names or, or values, which we actually send. Obviously they're all um, not getting sent, if I understand that correctly. That, that is correct. We are taking that very, very seriously. And uh, our stance is that we're not sending any kind of values uh, to our services. That's awesome. Good. That's really cool. Okay, so I think like we talked about now, like you showed us the the like the, the shell experience, right? And this is obviously super helping if I do interactive, um, uh, run interactively commands and I'm working with a system. But one thing we obviously do a lot with PowerShell is like scripting and actually writing PowerShell scripts and making sure that um, we, we can actually build them really, really fast. So can the AC, uh, the PowerShell predictors also help there? <clears throat> so AC predictor, um, we, we've been carrying that experience or we are actually working on carrying that experience to VS Code. Um, before we, we get to VS Code, um, I'd like to um, just complete the, the command I was showing you because there are a couple of elements around context that, that are interesting um, on this. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm creating a new AC resource group, um, predictors is actually here showing me a name of the resource group and the location. And I, as I said, and you've seen, we're not sending any private data to the API. However, locally, we're looking at the name of typical values that are used across commands. And in that case, uh, the typical value would be the name of resource group and the location. And when we provide our suggestions or the recommendations here, we will inject <clears throat> the value from the previous command, uh, the resource group that has been used for the previous command. So in that case, the Ignite demo or location with US2 are values that have been using a previous command and they are carried over in the pre prediction and suggestion that are coming here. Awesome, that's really cool. So let's switch to VS Code because we were talking about VS Code and uh, and I think VS Code is is probably the, a lot of the preferred experience from a lot of those out there in the community. Um, for people that have been working with PowerShell for a really really long time, when they were using ISC as an editor, um, you know they could tab through their options, and I think the experience has vastly improved in VS Code. So I, I don't I used to miss old the old ISC days, but I think I've moved on now and I've really accepted and embraced VS Code, um, which has been great. <clears throat> So as you said, we, 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 we brought and we want to bring that experience that we have in the shell in VS Code. And, and here is a, is a small script. <clears throat> the script is, has two values, um, location and resource group name. Um, I'm creating a resource group and then I'm creating a keyword. Very, very standard, um, I would say, approach on creating Azure resources. Um, now we, we brought the same experience and let's say you want to do some activity around keyword. And, and think about the same experience that you have seen, the predictions coming here, they are coming in the in VS Code as here's a recommendation of what could be the proper command to use after you've done a resource group and a keyword. Um, and one of the first suggestion is add az keyword key. And, and you can see all the parameters and values that are suggested by the, the, the same API we're using. So if I'm accepting this one, we brought the same experience in VS Code that we have seen in the command line where we actually look and learn from the previous command about the name of the, of the vault and the name of the resource group. So here, the name of the vault has been learned from the previous command, the one we have in line eight. And, um, and the key, well, that's the one. And for resource group, we do the same thing, same thing for, for location. So, we are blending the experience of predictive intelligence in VS Code. It's something that we're working on. It's really work in progress. It's 
literally a build I got yesterday night and uh, just, uh, just showing it to you. <laughs> Awesome, Damien, that's fantastic. Uh, that's really cool. Is there a um, kind of like the future of where you think this is gonna go, some of the new features that are gonna come into it? So a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> so we're working on, on having this extension out in the, in the, in the near future. A um, few weeks, months from now, uh, we will have a product preview of that extension. Awesome. We want to ensure we bring the right experience and in integrate it nicely with the PowerShell extension. So you have the predicted intelligence from PowerShell and the intelligence uh, coming with Azure uh, PowerShell extension for that. Um, we're also looking at enabling the predictive intelligence in Cloud Shell. So when you go to Cloud Shell, you have that, um, that experience as well. That'd be cool. Cause when I've worked in Cloud Shell in the past, I don't get that experience and I miss it. So I don't, I don't enjoy it as much. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. I agree, I agree. Like uh, it's all the time, like, you have this awesome experience, but then you want to show something cool in Cloud Shell because Cloud Shell works really well with that and, and so on, and you use it for various reasons. And then you miss that. And so I'm like super happy that this is coming there as well. So thank you. Cool. Awesome, Damien. Well, is there anything else you have left to share with us today on predictive intelligence? Because this is really cool to see how everyone made everything automatically work uh, because I can, I hopefully write better scripts and commands now that I can have a little bit of help. As, a, as, as our, our, uh, our approach remains to have an intuitive experience that is fully integrated with your, um, your muscle memory, whoever is on the keyboard, we don't want to interfere with that experience. The smooth, uh, the agility you have on the, with the keys, we want to be blended in that experience. And we're very careful on, this user, on that user experience. While we want to improve the recommendation we're making, so it's an ongoing progress, ongoing work. And, and the more uh, people are using it, the better we will know uh, uh, what are the right suggestions to make. I love so, how you just said agility with the keyboard. That's awesome. Because I feel like I'm a three-legged water buffalo when I type. So I would love to be agile on a keyboard. So awesome. And I think, Thomas, you had something to add? Yeah, I just want to say, so I, I'm excited that it only gets smarter over time, right? So it gets better and better uh, over time. So really looking forward. Awesome. Thank you, Damien, so much. Thank you for coming and sharing all that awesome information with us. So for everyone else out there, we're going to be back with one more session, and you don't want to miss this. So hold on for just a quick break, and we'll be back in a moment. Learn more about the inside stories of the development and building of PowerShell. Get your copy of Shell of an Idea by Don Jones today. Welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video so far and learned a lot. Um, but one of the most exciting things is just starting now, right, April? Absolutely. Because it's cool to hear about how to do stuff and what's out there. But we really want to know what's coming down the pipeline. Like, what's the roadmap? What's the vision? We've seen PowerShell transform over the years. So we're going to welcome in Michael who's going to tell us all the things about the vision, the roadmap for the PowerShell team. So Michael. Hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I just wanted to spend, um, th this is going to be, you know, short and sweet, uh, probably two or three slides. Although all my slides are actually marked down being rendered by the show markdown commandment. So it won't be too bad um, about like, what are we thinking about? Where are we going? That kind of stuff. So I like to start this off by setting the context and thinking about what is the goal of PowerShell and, and the PowerShell team? Like where, wh wh what do we think about every day? And this is, we, we tried to get it down to, you know, kind of like the traditional notion of a, a mission statement. Um, what is it we're trying to do here? And so we think about this pretty much every day as we're setting the priorities, uh, what we're going to be working on, but we got it down to, we want to improve the lives of people working on operations tasks by simplifying oper automation. Um, so this has three parts. The first is improve the lives of people. And I would say across both PM and engineering, that's the number one thing we think about, like is the work that we're doing, what problem is it solving? Who's it for? How are they gonna use it? Is their life better, yes or no? If it's not, maybe it's not something we need to work on right now, right? Um, so that improve the lives of people is super, super important. Um, operations tasks kind of allows us to have scope. So we're not trying to figure out how to create the next uh, 
language that will be used for building web apps, right? Where, where we see PowerShell being used is by people who are working typically in operations, but we also see people like lots and lots of people who are developers that are doing operations things. And so we want to be very friendly and open to that audience as well. Um, and some of them, you know, really like you were seeing with the predictors, they may not even really realize that they're using PowerShell or PowerShell solution. That it's the terminal window that they launched when they click on the terminal icon. And so uh, we want that to be a great experience for anybody doing any kind of an operations task, whether it's running Git, running SSH, you name it. And then that last port, last part, uh, just sums it up by saying simplifying automation. So I think, you know, you recently gave the example of making scripts easier to write. Um, that is super, super important. And I think uh, a big part of where we see a lot of organizations trying to go is moving faster with the same amount of people they already have. And so making things simple, bringing the context to the author is very, very important to us. You shouldn't constantly be having to leave your experience, go figure out how something works and come back. We need to figure out ways that we connect these things. Um, so it's an intuitive uh, part of your world. Awesome. So I, I wouldn't necessarily call this our roadmap. I would say this is more like our vision. These are directions we're headed. These are things we're investigating. Um, so I, I think about this as, you know, we, we were trying to again, put this into something we could articulate. So we just started building out all lists and lists and lists of all of our ideas and lots and lots of files. And um, some some common clusters started to develop, right? So this is kind of like traditional planning exercises. A bunch of things fell into a bucket that we decided to just call shell enlightenment. And so as you look at the predictors and things like that, there is a ton of stuff that there's almost no bad ideas in this space. Right. It's how do you make the shell smarter? Um, predictors are a big one. And we, you know, which today we showed history and AZ, but we see a ton of potential for other types of predictors um, and, and making it extensible so that the world can go build whatever predictors they want. And, and you know, if somebody wants to go, um, you know, create a new niche in, the, in that space, I think there's tons and tons of opportunity there. Um, we're also looking super close at natural language, which, by the way, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, people were asking, and when PowerShell first came along, like, what does AI mean? What does machine learning mean for scripting or for, you know, at the time it was like, well, you can run scripts via bots. <laughs> that was the only answer we had. But now we're starting to see technology emerge where it becomes simple to convert from natural language to code. And when I say code, I'm including scripts. And so I think the opportunity is coming and the, the day is coming. And if you go watch some of the build demos um, or go look, Steve Lee's got a, um, a module out in his GitHub repo uh, to work with the codex stuff that they showed at build. We can put that in the link um, as for follow ups. It's like type a comment that says, I want to create a VM on Hyper-V and you hit a hotkey and it writes the script that will go create a VM on Hyper-V. Like it's disturbingly accurate. And this is this is again like this isn't something that I see tomorrow we'll ship a feature that does this. I think we'll explore this area and figure out what is that what does it mean to bring artificial intelligence and machine learning into I mean we've been using stuff like IntelliSense for forever, right? It's just making that stuff smarter. Um and part of making it smarter, one of the things we really want to investigate. So Danny showed uh some things around cloud shell where it was like uh, what we call command injection and things like that. It's like, um, I'm in a portal or I'm, I'm in a website and you'll see this in other areas as well. And somehow I want to take the things I'm interacting with and like, you know, he did it for SSH commands. He hit the button, it warned you, and then it brought the command into your shell. So how do we interlink these experiences? Because a lot of people will go to a portal and figure out how things work and then figure out how to automate it. Yep. So it's like, how do you link these experiences in a way that accelerates that learning? Like, I, I just figured this out. Now I want to script it. How do I how do I shortcut that learning process? And I think that extends into docs just as well, whether it's like from docs to the shell or from the shell back to docs, because you can't put everything in help. So like, how do you how do you how do you reduce like make that bridge a little bit shorter? Um and then I, I actually think for enlightenment, this is a space where 
uh, a lot of our partners will 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 like put springs on our legs and, and push us into heights that we never could have reached before. So I'm talking about things like VS Code and Windows Terminal and other tools like that where we want to work super, super closely. Uh, if you've used Copilot in VS Code, it's absolutely amazing, works great for PowerShell. So, you know, how do we work more closely with those teams? And how do we you know, build on things like Cloud Shell? So, you know, one of the great things about Cloud Shell, when you go sign in, everything's already there for you. Well, can we have some notion of that available to you whenever you're using PowerShell outside of Cloud Shell? And we don't even know what that means yet. We wanna go talk to a hundred people and ask them like, try this, try this. What would you like, you know, if these were connected and see what their answers are, then we'll figure out how to build something like that. So um, that's a big area of what we're thinking about for Shell Enlightenment. That's uh, awesome. So yeah, any any questions? <laughs> I mean, I have probably a thousand questions, um, but it's things like you talked about, like going back to docs. So if we look at some of our problem statements of, we write a script, what the heck does it do? Um, we're terrible at writing comments and actually, and we need to create docs or like a wiki. Um, I've done this with actually Terraform. When I write my Terraform, um, uh, code into the file, it, there's a, there's an add in a third party added that will generate a readme of what my code's doing. Stuff like that is awesome. That documents for the next person. Um, you know, all these things that are intelligent to help us write better commands and write better code. Um, I can think of like a million things that would be amazing, but yeah, how do we get there? And what is useful to the normal person? Um, when well, yes. I say normal person, like, you know, to your everyday user versus me, who's off in the cloud and someone who's working on prem, like, you know, where are their time crunches in their day? Where are they struggling? And you're right. Like, how do I automate this thing, but then learn how it works and how do I accelerate that? Because, yes. um, you know, we have tools out there that generate templates for infrastructure as code. How do we do that for PowerShell? I mean, we can go search a repo, but you know, it's, it's, how do we generate those things automatically effectively instead of just a command line? How can I do a script? Yep. You nailed it. Yep. So th those are the things that we're thinking about. Um, and that, that's just a, like a huge, huge area. There's nothing out of scope for that. So we're just collecting information. Um, the second one is, is something that I was really pleasantly surprised came up again and again and again, as like each person on the team contributed, there was a sincere passion for, uh, what we eventually labeled diversity of users, but what we really mean by that is uh, th like expand the people who are part of the PowerShell community to be a lot of people that you hadn't seen there in the past. And that can mean people from different backgrounds. That can mean people, you know, for, uh, of, of different, you know, uh, I, I guess I'll just stick with backgrounds, but from, from any, you know, any part of the world and things like that, different languages and, that, and uh, where they grew up and that kind of stuff. Um, but also one of the things we keep can keep coming back to is accessibility. Mm -hmm. Like predictors are amazing, but if you're using a screen reader, is it just going to read every one of those items in the list every time it refreshes? And so we've been meeting a lot with accessibility experts to figure out, well, what how could we make automation really easier and better to use if you're not you know someone that can just open a terminal and type into it the way that we picture ourselves doing it um and april you mentioned uh, neurodiversity i mean i think that that fits into this space really really well it sounds like you've been exploring some of that area recently yeah i have and i mean i work with i mean again i've lived in different cultures i've worked in a different culture from where i grew up in and I work in a very um, diverse melting pot area of the world where people come in from all over the world, where English isn't their first language, but then also different life um, uh, years and years in their role. So yeah. I've been in I've been in tech for 25 years. Um, and then today I was speaking to university students and and they are so smart, but like they don't use PowerShell. They don't quite know what to do with it yet. Um, and when you're teaching to them and you're like, oh, I've learned this language. And I'm like, well, what about something that's object oriented? Well, why would I do that? So I think it's just also learning backgrounds, et cetera. Um, and I, and it, the neurodiversity thing is huge. It's also how we process data in our brains. Um, you know, I never realized I had my own coping mechanisms for years. Never realized. I was just like, oh, this is how I am. It's no big deal. Um, and I find that we all write code differently. We work at different times of the day. Like I'm a morning person. Someone might be an evening person or someone might be like a two to 4 p.m. coder, right? Or, I mean, 
Yeah. We, we write yeah, at different sure. times a day, um, but we all have different, our bodies work different ways. And I think it's great to recognize that and work on teams that can acknowledge that as well. Um, but yeah, we have such a diverse pool of candidates and, you know, whether it's age um, or culture, et cetera, there's, there's so much that goes into diversity we use as a big overlaying stamp effectively but i think there is no normal what i was told years ago and i used it as a teenager i was quite angsty i still am but i was an angsty teenager um normal is a drier setting right there <laughs> is literally no normal out there um so i think that's a great thing to keep in mind like you know as and i say that to young people that are watching this and people that are you know a little bit l longer in the tooth in their careers like what is normal? Normal is literally a drier setting. Uh, my career path wasn't normal. My, you know, I was never a normal teenager. What is a normal teenager, right? I'm still not a normal adult. So normal is absolutely a drier setting. And I think it applies to tech. Like we all have such different backgrounds and we bring that together. And that's what makes such amazing teams is that, yeah, you have a different background in this. Bring that experience, bring that knowledge, like let your voice be heard. And I think absolutely. I mean, Damien showed it with the color background. Oh, I like blue. Blue is nice. Maybe I'll try green. I don't like green. Um, you know, it gives us the opportunity to kind of trial and error some stuff and find ways we might have not realized will help us do better in our careers. Absolutely. I think one thing which really struck me during all these sessions, there were like a couple of things I liked, like the remoting part and, and all that. But like what I realized is there's really like two things, right? There's like, and, and we talked about this before, um, there's one is the PowerShell language itself, right? But then all the shell features and all that it comes with it where you don't even need to use PowerShell, like, or to know that you use the PowerShell language, but you still get a huge benefit. Like that, that to me is like, wow, this is really opening up to many, many more users um, using PowerShell, not necessarily just the language, but like all PowerShell can deliver. So that, that to me was like, it's very exciting to see. So you actually nailed a good one there. Um, as part of diversity, one of the things we're interested in is how do we just make PowerShell a great place to work as, as, an, as a shell experience, right? Um, so on the latter half of what you were saying there, where it's like it's, it's the terminal experience, um, you saw almost all of the, I think you did see all four speakers talk about how to use their scenario with commands that aren't really PowerShell in the sense of like verb dash now. And it's not that we're going away from that. Like that is an important part of the PowerShell experience, but what if you want to run git.exe or you want to run SSH? What if you want to get a secret from your vault and pass that in to some command that has nothing to do with PowerShell? You just happen to be running in the PowerShell window. What if you want to uh, wrap some other language with PowerShell or use some other language and have it call PowerShell? Today, a lot there's a lot of like figuring things out in, in both of those directions that we'd like to make simpler. And I don't know that we'll necessarily solve that in the next six months or the next year. It's something that's on our minds of, when we talk about diverse new users, some of that even just means people who typically use other types of scripting languages or other development environments and figuring that out. And I, I think you've nailed it. And I, I will bring up something that happened to me uh, a couple of years ago. So I was working on a team, um, an engineering team, and this one person is very much an open source person. This person said, um, open source all the way. They they use open source tooling at every possible turn. Um, and there was a discussion on Microsoft Teams internally at Microsoft about PowerShell uh, within the engineering community. And I got tagged into a conversation and I felt like, here we go. But the argument was, and this is again, prior to PowerShell 7, you know, back in the day, uh, especially in the IT pro sysadmin area, you were either a Windows person or a Linux person. And we had this delineation in the teams and, you know, oh, I'm, I'm a Linux person or I only do open source, you know, Windows is, is, is terrible, don't use it. And then you had Windows people go, I'm not touching Linux. We had this silo within our own IT pro industry. Yep. And um, I went back to this person who's the open source person and I said, uh, it's no longer cool to be a Linux person or a Mac person or a Windows person. What's cool is to be cross-platform. And that's why PowerShell is cool because it is class cross-platform capable and inclusive of everyone. I love it. There was no response. So the ah. good news is, mic drop, I'm out. Um, but I think that's absolutely true. Like PowerShell emblazons this cross-platform identity now. It is cool to love PowerShell and it doesn't matter your background. And it is, I, I sounds a little bit cheesy, but the tool that brings 
our siloed IT pros together, right? Yeah, that's my hope. Yeah. That's how I see it. That's how I talk about it. And that's why I say it's such an awesome tool. So it cross platform is where it's at. That's the new normal, if you can call it normal, but that's the new way forward, right? Um, cross platform, cross, cross functional tooling. I love it. That's perfect. Um, the only thing I had on this uh, was there's a couple areas we think we'll probably reinvest, meaning mm -hmm. that we have made previous uh, investments and we're thinking about what we don't have a direct plan to like, this is what we're going to do. We're figuring out what does it mean to come back to this, whether it's finish what we started or, uh, you know, expand upon it or take it in new directions. And so uh, the, the three areas that I would say are top of mind. So certainly the top two would be uh, configuration, meaning like take another look at DSC. Uh, DSC is used all over the place in Azure. We want to, you know, lean in on that even more and, and keep making that um, part of the experience, but also figure out where are some other places where DSC can fit and how do we can, how do we keep compatibility? There's like closing in on 1400 community DSC resources in the gallery. Um, so you can manage just about anything for Windows. Uh, we recently published a new uh, NX tools module with the help of the community um, that focuses on configuring Linux. Uh, we're doing a lot to figure out um, there's actually a DSC working group within the open source uh, project of PowerShell. And so there's a lot of exploration right now into how can we expand that even further and make DSC even more flexible. So, um, so that's a big one. And then uh, in terms of remoting, like you heard Danny talk about SSH. I mean, that's a big, big area that unlimited potential. I mean, we could talk for the next hour just about the cool things you can do with remoting once you combine you know, the, the notion of PowerShell remoting and SSH together, uh, those just make it really cool. And then the other thing we haven't really talked about today is we're, we're really interested in learning how people collaborate and share as they are uh, working through PowerShell automation. So whether it's building modules, writing scripts, we see a lot of like, oh, you put something in the gallery or, you know, you, you've got a private NuGet feed um, or you've got private, you know, Git repos and things like that. But I think there's a there's a little bit more we could learn about. Okay, well, if you're working within like a highly secure environment and you've got a list of approved automation scripts, what does that end to end journey look like? How do you want to share them? What's the easiest way to distribute them onto your secure workstations and stuff like that? So this is just an area that we're going to start picking at a little bit to figure out if there's more work yet to be done in that area. So I think like configuration, remoting, and sharing is something that we're just feel like we could go back and, and do some additional work. Cool. I think also um, you talked about feedback from the community. I mean, Microsoft days of old, we've all been there um, for those in the industry for longer than others. I won't admit my age again. Um, you know, we didn't have this opportunity when I was in the infancy of PowerShell 2.0 to give this feedback to the PowerShell team. What are the ways that people can give feedback? And what I want to say to everyone watching, if you took nothing else out of these amazing mind blowing sessions, give feedback to the team. So, so Michael, how do we give that feedback? How do we participate? How do we have our voices heard? Well, I have a slide for that as well. Uh, you. <laughs> so to connect with us, um, there's really, I, I just want to put in focus three separate things. So one is Slack. Uh, we'll put all these links, you know, available for the video, but um, there's actually a dedicated, I think it's powershell.slack.com. It is super active. I mean, every, if, if you check it throughout the day, every single day, it's just bah, 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 just tons and tons of uh, people going out and, and helping each other to figure things out. Um, it's amazing. We we don't like monitor it, but I know like for me personally, I've got notifications set up. Uh, if somebody sends a message at to me, I'm gonna get a notification. It might take me a minute, but I'll 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 come when called <laughs> and, and see if I can help out. Uh, but I think that's true for. Uh, for the whole team and uh it's, it's an area where we feel like real time like being able to get in touch with us real time even if you don't have our email addresses and that kind of stuff is important to us uh if it is within the context of a specific project um, we do monitor github and github issues and github uh, prs one of the things we recently um uh, switched to and have been advocating with the community is every monday uh, we've got a standing all day appointment. So we call it community day and we just go out and work GitHub issues, GitHub PRs. It's not that we're not doing that other times, but that's a, that's a point in time where we wanted to just allocate block out time, um, 
engineers are going to be working on community stuff. PMs are going to be sorting through it. We recently even just started going out to uh, sites like Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, and looking at the discussions happening out there and see if there's anything we can do. So uh, I would just say GitHub issues, if, if it's specific to a project like PowerShell Get or Secrets Management, that's the best place to go. And then we do have community calls. Uh, there's a community call actually going on right now uh, for PowerShell. And then we also have a DSC community call that happens every six weeks. Uh, the community call, I would say, if you want to just have your finger on the pulse, like what's going on, what are you working on, um, what do you see coming in the next you know, month, things like that, the community call is the number one thing to join. And it's really fun. I mean, we, we have a good time uh, thinking through that. So that happens the, the third Thursday of every month. It's easy to set a reminder and jump in and uh, you don't have to talk. It's fine to just join and listen in and see what's going on. That's totally cool. Awesome. And I know that, um, I know you guys have the Slack channel, but the Discord channel as well. I know it's yeah. mostly community folks. Um, but again, if you have a PowerShell problem and you're just banging your head against a wall, which is pretty much my every day, the Discord channel is fantastic. Um, I know I'm on it. I don't monitor unless I'm tagged, same as yourself. I think there are so many different ways to communicate with people. And you know, the PowerShell Discord isn't the only way in which I communicate with people. And that's why, like you said, you have that community day every week because that gives dedicated time, helps you prioritize all the community stuff. But um, we will put all the links for the get uh excuse me the um powershell slack the powershell github repos and the community call data we will get that out to everyone um as we kind of wrap this up we'll give you all the links for all that so you can join and definitely join even if you're just listening you can learn from other people right that's the biggest thing learn from your peers someone else has had the exact same issue um and you can solve it together and we can make powershell better i love it yeah. that's all for me I appreciate awesome, Michael. You guys have done a really amazing job hosting PowerShell Unplugged today. And I wanted to say thank you to both of you. This has been fun. It's been really cool. Well, thank you for allowing us. I have learned more about PowerShell today than I have probably in the last five years, actually, <laughs> um, at least. <laughs> it was amazing. I'm glad we did this. So thank you so much for allowing us to host you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It was a super awesome experience. And again, there's so much cool stuff also coming in the pipeline. So really looking forward to that. As we close this off, I'm actually going to bring everyone else into the group. Um, so just for all of you on there, get your videos on. We're going to do a little outgoing thing. Um, I I actually found the best line in, in, uh, in Michael's header on VS Code. Um, I loved how you said shell. Yeah. So <laughs> I would love to end this awesome unplugged session with all seven of us going shell. Yeah. All right. You guys ready? Three, ready? two, one. Shell. Yeah. 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 Thanks guys. Thank you very much.